Seeing the presence of a quorum, I'll call to order this meeting of the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee at what looks to be around 6.34 p.m. And uh, as, as uh, always, or as typically the case, uh, this is being taped by Amherst Media for later broadcast. Um, our first order of business is approval of the minutes of March 26, 2019. And if the committee has had a chance to review the minutes, I'm going to entertain a motion. Approve the minutes. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. You have to move with unusual dispatch in a gavelous environment. You know, you gotta... <laughs> Any updates? Right, that's seeing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes of March 26, 2019, signify by raising your hand. Uh, is there any nays? Any abstentions? Uh, abstention, Spitzer, <coughs> and Ordonez. Otherwise, unanimous. Uh, so the next item on our agenda is announcements and public comments. Are there any announcements from the school committee? Mr. Dunley. Just a brief um, reminder that Autism Awareness Night is this Thursday, 4.30 to 7, the high school library right here. Um, I've been there the last two years. It's, it's a really great way to engage uh, with people on the autistic spectrum. If, if you don't have any friends or family members who are autistic, it's a great chance to just, just talk, have a conversation, and really just get a, a it's a real consciousness expanding experience I've found the last couple of years. So that's, that's at the high school, and it, uh, it actually bookends the uh, principal, one of the principal search uh, meetings, um, which is happening in the choral room. So if you show up early or leave uh, after that's over, you can stop by here, displays of art and all sorts of things, and it uh, should be a great night. Wonderful. Are there any other announcements? Seeing none, we'll now take public comment. If there are comments from members of the public, please come forward. You have to identify yourself, please. And uh, you'll have up to three minutes for uh, any comments you want to make. What's please. Nancy's last name? Good evening. I'm Susan DeGrav. I'm the parent of a ninth grader, Caroline DeGrav, at the high school. And I, I brought to, with me a copy of a a letter I wrote up, which is, I'm not sure if it's the right format, um, Freedom of Information Act request for the curriculum vitae and um, cover letters of the three candidates for principal at the high school. Because I have some concerns about the way the high school's been run. Um, I've had a couple of interactions that I wasn't entirely in agreement with. And um, I also went to the, the interview last night, and I want to go to all three of them. And I feel that I'm at a disadvantage not having the curriculum vitae. Um, I was told by the assistant superintendent that the reason that those are not being disclosed is because people will exhibit implicit bias, um, which I don't understand what that means. Um, I think she said pertaining to where someone went to school or other things. But I had to look up the candidates myself, and I have a couple of questions about you know, the resumes and some things I found out about if someone left their job or why and so forth. Um, also, on the issue of, um, it's my understanding that this was decided by a committee of parents and human resources people from the school and that it stemmed from the interviews with um, prior candidates from middle school, which I attended and I supported Joseph Smith, who's now the principal, and I greatly esteem him and someone had asked him a question about a typo in his resume. I feel that he was completely capable of responding to that and <coughs> dismissing that person, and he has had many jobs, and he got this job. And I feel that it's um, somewhat, how should I say, disempowering to the candidate to say that they can't handle any questions that the public may have. So in this regard, I feel that these three candidates should answer as well, because uh, while I have gotten some information about two of them, the middle candidate, um, who's the dean right now at the high school, I don't have any information that I've been able to obtain, and I require it. So if I could hand the um, letter up to the superintendent and to the school committee chair. Sure. And um, in the letter, I just kind Thank of you. looked up the Freedom of Information Act, um, and it said that you have 10 days to respond, but time is of the essence because the other interview is tomorrow night. So I've asked that the documents be produced by 4 p.m. tomorrow. Perhaps they could be posted. I know I recently got my Master of Arts in Teaching after another career. Um, 
and UMass posted the curriculum vitae and the letters, cover letters, of three candidates for director of student legal services. So everyone could go on and they could see and they could prepare prior to having questions. Because I'd much rather ask people, like I did last night with Mr. Strauss, how having a severely disabled son has informed his you know, practice in terms of special education and a lot of things like that. I think that's the kind of question that we'd like to ask, not how many years, you know, were you in this job or what's, what's your degree from? So I appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you. Are there further, are there further public comments? Hello. Uh, my name is Michael O'Connor. I am an employee of the district. I am a a social studies teacher at the middle school, uh, and in full disclosure, I am a uh, an executive board member of the APEA. Um, I am here, um, and it's just coincidental that um, the superintendent's evaluation is on the agenda for tonight, and I don't know if I can make it till 8.50, um, but um, I'm here to ask, um, it has uh, a question, and that is that um, in the past, at least at some point in my 14 years in the district, um, the staff, uh, the faculty, and the community were um, given an opportunity to offer feedback or input into a previous superintendent's evaluation. And, um, you know, I haven't dug deep into the DESE regulations. Uh, and not that that's the most significant aspect of this question, but um, I was wondering if such a thing uh, would be or could be included in the superintendent's evaluation, or if that evaluation is uh, being completed now and up for approval, um, was it included in that um, evaluation process? Um, as, and that's my question as a teacher and a community member. <clears throat> my question as a, an APA executive board comes from uh, some input from our membership as to as our staff, uh, teachers and paraprofessionals are going through the evaluation process. Um, they have questions about what is the evaluation process for uh, building administrators, uh, central office administrators and other people. Um, who might be in other positions that are not teaching or not specifically designated as management. And um, they were hoping to maybe receive, uh, either from the committee or the superintendent, some outline of how that process is carried out and um, whether or not um, there's an opportunity for staff to add input into that process. Um, I don't need necessarily a response, um, although if any one of you wanted to get back to me, um, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further public comments? Seeing none, we'll close the public comment period. Uh, the next item on our agenda is subcommittee updates. There's subcommittee updates. Uh, just real quick, the sure. policy subcommittee met um, uh, Monday, no, Thursday, <laughs> April 4th, um, and we reviewed the design selection procedure, which we're reviewing tonight. We also have a couple others that we want to bring back to the school committee um, at, a, at probably our next one, which is the student um, student to student harassment, which we now have the written legal opinion on that, and so I want to discuss some of the recommendations that they're making. Um, and the student discipline policy. Okay. Uh, yeah, so CPAC uh, has met a couple times. Um, there are a couple of items CPAC president wanted me to share. Um, first, and I think we mentioned this actually at the last regional committee meeting, but she just wanted to emphasize it again. Um, how extraordinary she found that um, we had the, uh, the special ed audit from DESE and that there was, there was no findings of, of any corrective action. Um, and if you know a CPAC, CPAC president, she's been engaged in a long time. You know, she she knows her stuff in terms of talking to other districts and other programs. And it really is a, a, a rare mark of achievement for the district, um, and shows um, just just a tremendous amount of of work uh, and dedication from staff at all levels. Because if you have great administration, but your teachers aren't doing so well, you'll you'll get cited for something. If you have teachers are doing well, but your administration, you'll get cited somewhere. And so to sort of have nothing is really. Extraordinary. So I know we did emphasize that, but she wanted me to make a point of just 
um, thanking the, the district and the, and the, the administration and, and the teachers and the staff, because it goes all the way down to teachers and powers, co-teachers in the classroom, everybody who works with our students. Um, so that was one nice thing. <laughs> um, the other update is, um, so the board is uh, hopefully starting to come together for next year, um, but we still really need additional board members on CPAC, so other parent volunteers to come join the board. And um, I guess the one th um, thing I would say is to try and pitch membership on the board is that it's really make your own level of commitment. You know, if there's an hour or two that you feel you want to volunteer and dedicate to listening and doing some, some work for uh, special needs students and how special needs are serviced in our district, that's great. And there's, there's a place on the CPAC board for you. It's really a trying to have this be a, a big table, kind of everybody supports each other in, in the many things that CPAC does. So um, we're looking forward to, uh, to getting that board established over the course of the spring. Yes, um, so I'm going to save the updates from the superintendent evaluation mm -hmm. subcommittee to later, um, but we will be dis discussing it later on this evening, and we're just in the early stages now, so it's a great time to get feedback. So, um, right. Um, and I wanted to also just announced that I was just elected chair of the OPEB Board of Trustees about 15 minutes ago. <laughs> and, uh, and we signed the trust agreement, um, which was approved by the school committee previously. Cool. It's like one of those hidden super important things. I know. That most people in the public have no idea about, but it's actually monumentally important. Yeah, doing a little <laughs> overwhelmed by the commitment. The, uh, is Just very briefly, uh, the Collaborative for Educational yeah. Services. So we had a meeting uh, last week, I believe, and I just wanted to mention to the committee, um, I spoke with Dr. Morris briefly about this, uh, the Executive Director Bill Deal, his evaluation process is actually, uh, we're going through the evaluation process for him now. And so, you know, if, if anyone on the committee or in the community has had any experience um, with Mr. Deal or services, um, I welcome any feedback and <coughs> input into that process, and we're hoping to get the evaluation done sometime in the early summer. So, soon the better. All right. Nothing on athletics. Facilities use is done. So, labor is not anything. No, no, no labor agreements. Uh, so, yes, so. Um, two things. One on the, um, the CPAC. I'd like to give a big shout out to Nancy Stewart who is stepping down as the president of CPAC. She has worked at least four, if not f the five years that I've been somewhat involved with it tirelessly. And I just want to say thank you and not to worry that parents will pick it up and it will go forward. <laughs> and also parents, students and parents, guardians of the special needs, please fill out the STARS applications <laughs> and you know, um, please highlight those teachers and staff that help your student on a daily basis so that the CPAC can pat them on the back, give them a high five, and say thank you. Yep. And a balloon. Yes, and a balloon. Yes, <laughs> that's cool. It's pretty good. It's wonderful. I, I was wondering, do, we, do you, um, I know this could be doing the superintendent's updates, but this is probably not in the updates. Do you include things in your weekly newsletter, like recruiting members for LPAC or CPAC? Yes. Uh, we have for LPAC, CPAC, um, we, ha we certainly can. Um, we sort of rely on CPAC to give us the messaging uh, sure. for that. So Yeah, I could take that back to the, to the board. I mean, we just, just a little blurb paragraph I think it would be great. It just seems like that would hit like yep. an amazingly wide great audience idea. of folks who might not be thinking yeah, about great it idea. otherwise. Great. So. Cool. And one more. Oh, sure. And as sure. I attended my first collaborative meeting last week and I just want to give a shout out to the Mount Tom students who showed who showed up and shared some of their story with us it was quite enlightening That's great cool any other subcommittee updates seeing none uh, we'll move to the superintendent's update sure so there is a written um, copy of that to be in front of you um, I just want to note that last week uh, the commissioner was here uh, at our my monthly roundtable meeting and uh, appreciate <laughs> Chair Nakajima and Chair Hall from the Pelham School Committee for attending and really was about where he sees education going and um, kind of as he's done a mostly um, 
a listening tour that has lasted most of the year where we visited schools, including this, uh, the Amherst Public Schools anyway, not the region. Um, he's going to come out with some information in June, is what he shared uh, about next steps um, of how he thinks the dish, the excuse me, the, the Commonwealth can move forward in terms of public education. I don't know if you had anything you'd like to add. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I was, um, I don't know. I mean, if people interact with the state and, and uh, around school funding issues, regulations, high stakes testing, any number of things, you meet lots of really wonderful people, but you also sometimes worry that those who are leading the educational sort of endeavor of the state may not be as well aligned as they could be in terms of what their daily priorities are as a lot of our, you know, our teachers and building leaders and things like that, and people we have a community who are really engaged in education. And what struck me um, favorably, and we'll see, I guess, in June, when he said in the DESE educational plan, that a strategic plan, essentially, that he's going to unveil, should come out. We'll see the proof will be in the pudding to see right. what happens then. But he talked a lot about the importance of arts and play and creative um, activities to integrate learning, interdisciplinary learning, um, a really a child-centered approach that seemed to me to be moving away from, or recognizing the limits and the deficiencies in um, a test-driven environment, high-stakes test-driven environment. And I don't know where that's going to go, but it seemed refreshing to hear. And um, by sheer coincidence, uh, a good uh, one of my best friends actually used to be a building teacher under him when he was principal of the Edwards Middle School and told me that the, as, as a principal, he's somebody who walked the walk very much in terms of how he engaged. So it's, it's just what I like about it also is that depending on what comes forward uh, later is um, life is complicated, right? You can have lots of things you argue about and lots of things you disagree about, but it's all. But it's. But if you can find other things that you agree strongly on, you can find a shared commitment. Then it gives you a sense you can actually move things forward uh, as a state. And that would be in the environment we have around education policy and really funding and charter schools. It would be welcome if there were areas and other areas in which we could, there could be broad shared agreement where we could work together, yeah. which would be great. But we'll see in June. We will. Um, a couple other quick ones, just uh, uh, was referenced earlier, but the principal search update. So there's uh, one candidate came yesterday. We have another candidate tomorrow, one candidate Thursday. Uh, and all of those public meetings, um, I believe, are 530 to 630 um, at the high school. 515. 515. Thank you. Much better. Um, my apologies. And window into ARP, so the, the latest episode uh, involved or included um, Evelina Kino, who's the middle school climate coordinator, uh, who's done work both at the middle school and high school, as you met her, I think, at the December, one of the December meetings. Uh, another person you met there was um, high school student Petua, um, and um, it was great. So that episode is live. I think it was emailed out to the, the committee as well as the community, but um, it gives a, another more in-depth information about the restorative program at the high school and the work now and the work in the, moving forward. Uh, there was a question at the last meeting about high school climate service that was completed, I guess that would be last week. Um, for all, two grade levels were done. The other two grade levels had the survey that came through with the MCAS and some other tools. So um, there's only so much surveys that we can ask students to do, but we'll have lots of rich data sources moving forward. Um, you yeah. know, we've, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, Dr. Morris, can I just ask a quick question yeah. on that? So when will the information or the data from that survey be released? So our survey was uh, completed last week, so it probably a little later this spring we'll be able to bring it here if the committee wants and talk talk about it and look at the two years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, high, the MCAS one that we looked at a, a little bit at strategic planning, that takes them quite a bit more time to right. get that back to us. Um, next month, um, vaping is certainly a topic across the Commonwealth that's um, influencing the health and well-being of, of many people, but including teenagers. Um, and so I'll be attending. I know there's some other staff members who are also attending a conference. Um, that's a statewide conference. The Mass Health Council is putting it together with the Commissioner of Public Health um, and someone who's really in charge of substance abuse and addiction, Boston Children's. So if anyone's interested in attending uh, from the committee, you know, please let me know. And um, certainly it's a critical issue for all of us. And that's why I'm you know, choosing to go as well as other, bring other staff members is that um, everyone knows it's an issue. And because it's um, a rather 
younger issue. Um, everyone's trying to figure out exactly what are the best steps for prevention and education. And so I really appreciate the State Health Council for bring, having an organized way because otherwise you're looking online, you're looking at you know curricula and I'm talking to other superintendents, but it's not really, this is the first one I've seen that's truly uh, organized and orchestrated for statewide conversation on the topic. Um, <coughs> regional budget discussions, so just an update that we've, uh, Mr. Magano and I were with the uh, Amherst Finance Committee and then the Amherst Town Council over the last few weeks and the conversations in the regional budget were both, you know, were relatively productive and slated to be voted um, next week after, I think, next. Um, but um, all indications are a broad support from the council. And ju just a note, because there isn't a town meeting, they had to do it out of order, so there are other budgets, just for people who might be wondering, it's, there are other budgets which are the town budget is, is being presented in a different order, but based on where the warrants of other town meetings and the charter, they actually had to take it up in, uh, in out of order of the rest of the town budget. So people might be wondering, oh, I haven't heard anything about the elementary schools or the rest of the town. This was actually a standalone item for the council and the finance committee. Um, last Thursday night, the success after high school group had an opportunity to meet over in the family center. I know Mr. Sheehan was able to stop by and see that group really trying to support students um, who are trying to think about where they want to go after high school and for many of the students it's first generation potentially first generation college students so it's providing extra support and guidance uh, for them so thanks to Dr. Guevara for organizing that and the last one is um, an anti-semitism workshop so this is something we talked about earlier this year and just Close, not closing loops, but getting back to something that was discussed, that uh, we're working with Karen Rhodes, who is the Education Coordinator, Youth and Family Education Director at the Jewish Community of Amherst. She's come in and done multiple workshops after school for high school students, and that was sort of the action plan that the students had developed after Dr. Gramacki and I met with them after the incident. Um, and the general consensus that I'm hearing is that they've been very positive, productive, and providing a broader education for high school students, um, and not just for Jewish high school students, but for our allies as well. So I wanted to come back to that one, and that's my update. Other questions from the committee? So um, back in the day when uh, Amherst had a town meeting, we, uh, um, Sometimes when the regional budget was being approved, there would be regional members there, as and we would, we'd be encouraged to be there. Do, do you know how that's going to play with the town council? Like, are, should we come? Is it? I'm, I'm sure we're welcome to come, but is our, what's the yeah. what's the point of attack? I guess. So uh, this is the maiden voyage, as you know, <laughs> uh, and so Mr. Mangano and I did the first two. We let the chair be aware, but the indication we got from the town manager and the um, town council was that. They didn't see a need for broad school committee representation uh, unless there had questions that, you know, probably Mr. Mangano and I couldn't answer, and not financial questions, but broader questions. And um, we've been told that we don't need to return for um, the next meeting or two <laughs> for this to talk about because they have the sufficient information from the budget documents and the presentations that have been made. So um, the short story is, I wanted to give you a long story because I want to answer it fully, but uh, unless we get some additional inf in information that, more presence is needed, I think um, we'll just update you on that. It was interesting. Not really, um, I don't know how the other town meetings operate, but in Amherst there was definitely the sort of the dog and pony show aspect mm -hmm. of getting everyone there to sit together and mm -hmm. demonstrate that how much we all care and agree with one another. Um, and apparently this is like the exact opposite. <laughs> it's like I've looked at the spreadsheet, I understand the spreadsheet, I don't need to hear from you. Yeah. I think it's, it's worth noting that uh, both, I don't want to speak for, for Mr. Mangano, um, but I found, and I think he would agree, that um, they asked really good questions, right? It, it, it had that similar feel of people really digging into budget, looking at, you know, on page 63 of this long document, help me understand school choice. That was like, and it, for instance, a question that came up that people wanted more information. I'm looking at Mr. Mangano, there was a couple other topics. Um, the roof, yeah. Um, so there were there were definitely topics. I don't. Yeah, I also don't want to paint a picture that we weren't there for. We were there for five minutes and left. Um, so I really appreciate the robust conversation that was that we had with the town councilors and their interest and involvement in it, and also their use of the four town meetings as a backdrop to understand better um, the regional assessment method, which is you know I think I might have said it's a it's about as um, complex uh, without a clear reason unless you understand regional funding uh, a topic as they will receive. Um, but I thought they were really productive meetings.
Uh, further questions for the superintendent? Feels like most of my work for the schools is engaged at a different level of level of the schools. So I'll move on from the chair's report. Other than going to that cool meeting we went to. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, process to explore educating sixth grade students in the middle school. Uh, if we could have come up with a title that was both more descriptive and somehow still convoluted. <laughs> Um, but, it, but if you read it, it's, it's kind of exactly what it sounds like, right? Yeah, yeah. no, I, I stressed over the title, actually, and, and that's the best I could come up with. I don't know if that's a positive or negative thing to say oh, about sure. oneself. But, uh, yeah, so I want to um, actually have some, some uh, kind of introductory comments before I go through slides. Um, so the first thing I want to be clear on, and we're trying to do this at our meetings, is to be clear on what the purpose is of this topic. And... For me, the purpose is that I'd be asking, I'm not asking for a vote, but asking for general support that this is a topic worth studying, um, the ex exploring sixth through eighth grade in, in, uh, in an educational model. And so the reason I'd be asking for that is I want to be clear that there's some re the two most precious things we have in terms of resources, which is time and money. Both, uh, yeah? You're not asking for a vote tonight, right? I am not asking for a vote at all. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Didn't yeah. you just say something similar to that? I'm sorry, I'll restart. Um, so um, what I'm asking for is support, but not a vote. Okay. Because uh, I don't think one is. is but you're needed. not looking for support tonight directly either, are you? No, but just a general. Con okay. I, mean, I think I'm, it'll make more sense. I'm not trying to be dumb. No, no, no. It's just that, you know we talked about announcing what the point of a particular yeah. item is when we yeah. start, and part of the point was to be really concrete. Yes. It's either a discussion, a presentation, yeah. or a vote. Yeah. And, you know. Yeah. I want to know which it is. So it's a discussion, um, but one of the things. So let me restart, given that. I appreciate the feedback. So what I, what I want to have a discussion about and want to leave the meeting feeling is that, um, that the committee is, is more or less on board um, that um, we can, that I'm going to spend, I'm, I'm recommending that we spend resources, but time and money, to explore this topic. And so if there was broad concern at the regional level that no, this is, this is not something worthy of study, uh, we wouldn't engage in. That's why it's a regional topic. It's not an Amherst school committee meeting tonight. It's not a Pelham school committee meeting tonight. It's a regional topic because I think this is, at this point, a regional issue. Um, and so uh, for me, and I think that it's clear you've all seen the slides already, um, that, that for me, I do think there's value in exploring this topic and not value, and I'm not recommending moving sixth grade to the middle school tonight. I want to be uber clear about that before I even get through slides. What I am suggesting is, I, in my opinion, it's worthy to study this topic. And so that's the kind of feedback I want. If at the end of the night I'm leaving and I'm feeling like, wow, you know, no one is with me on this, that this is worthy of study, that's information I need because it's about resource management uh, for me. I also want to um, say, uh, particularly for Mr. Sullivan, I know Ms. Kaczynski isn't here, that I met and shared this slide deck with uh, Jen Haggerty, who's the superintendent of Union 28 in Leverett and Shutesbury. So I met with her on Thursday at lovely Shutesbury Elementary School, no less. Um, and I wanted her, even though this is a regional topic, I want to be as inclusive as possible as we talk about this. And I don't want anyone in any of the communities to feel like, where did this come from? The superintendent or the committees wouldn't know. And, you know, we talked about this loosely at the Pelham School Committee. Not loosely. It was on the agenda. We talked about it, uh, not the slides, but the general concept at the Pelham School Committee meeting last week as well, because one of this, there's a lot of politics involved in this, and I don't mean like Democrat, Republican politics, but um, uh, the politics of making sure everyone feels included, everyone has the same information. Um, there's no conspiracy, there's no games here. It's actually, frankly, just, do we want to study this? Can we have an inclusive group to study it? And then let's see where that, the chips fall at the end of that. I think the last kind of um, introductory comment I made is that uh, two times last week, once with central office directors and once with principles pre-K to 12, I went over the kind of earlier draft of this presentation because, again, it's about resource management and if there was concerns that principals or central office directors had about spending resources to explore this, I needed to know that. And uh, what I want to say is there's broad support for exploring the topic. Again, not making a change, but exploring the topic and, and really helpful feedback that shifted the presentation from where it was last Tuesday morning to what, what's in front of you. Um, and I just want to thank the administrative team for being so highly engaged in the topic. So all that being said, um, we can now uh, get to 
the slides. So really what I want to present is what's our current model? What's the work that we've done to date um, around this? What is the rationale for exploring grade six through eight middle school model? What are concerns that would need to be addressed? A timeline and an exploration model. Those are the types of things I want to talk about. I also want to be clear that um, this is a tricky balance because what I'm trying to do tonight is to share my perspective and my recommendation of exploring it. And to do that, I have to say what, why it might be a good idea to do it. But I want to be, again, very clear that those are reasons that a threshold that I need to meet before we put the resources into it. It's not a game to say that we should do, make this change. Um, so I know I'm like beating that drum very loudly, but I, I think it's worth beating. Um, so just a little history that we're currently a 7th through 8th middle school. Prior to that, for a great many years, we were a 7th through 9th um, junior high school. I don't want to ask, look around the table and ask anyone. Ms. Kaczynski isn't out here, but I know she attended a 7th through 9th middle school. And there's a mother. Yeah, I wasn't looking at you awesome. specifically, Mr. Nefantino. There are a bunch of us. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> But uh, that attended, so it, it has a so long... So the cool thing is you're saying 1998. Yeah. That gives me lots of lying <laughs> where you hit when I actually graduated. That's right. Um, so it has a longer history actually being a three-year school than being a two-year school or just about the same. And I think it's a little longer uh, at a three-year school level. Um, and it had a population of, of north of 700 students um, at that time. That has been a major... You know, infrastructure changes in, in the last bit. LSSC coming in is the most, probably the most significant. And just a little bit of uh, local and, and national context, the grade se seven through eight middle school is a less common model. So I put up the data from Massachusetts, uh, thanks to a community member who actually were, sent me this uh, unrequested, which was great. Um, but you can see that grade six through eight schools are about five or six times more common than seven, eight, and, and even five through eight schools are about twice as common as grade <coughs> seven, eight schools, which doesn't mean that seven, eight schools can't work. It's just there's a lot of models that we can draw from about what could work down this line. So none of that is to say grade seven, eight schools are wrong, but um, clearly other communities have found other models that can work for students and we can learn from. So the work to date, the Regional Facilities Master Use Study, uh, by the way, the full 608-page um, document is now online, and it's huge. So it, you download it, and you'll probably get a message like, oh, my virus scan can't work, but that's just because of the size. It's not because it has a virus. Um, and so it's a really helpful document of describing the study that you all had two presentations about, but for the community as well. Um, there, was a there was a consensus in the advisory board there to pursue an analysis of a grade 6 through 8 model. And that the study also found that sixth grade can be moved to the middle school without capital projects or costs required. I followed up with, uh, we have a superintendent listserv, and I just said, hey, who's got like a grade six through eight model? And how's it working? Um, so this is a listserv that, it, that goes out to all superintendents across the Commonwealth. I had 35 responses, which is pretty good. And the, it's a bad analogy, perhaps, but... Um, I, when I get those, I, as much as I like my colleagues, it's like a JetBlue, how's your flight? Like, if you have a normal flight, you usually don't respond, and if things are really good or really bad, you tend to respond. Um, so that's whenever I put things out, that's typically the responses that I get, and other people as well. And so at 35 responses, again, urban, suburban, eastern, central, western Massachusetts, uh, what was a surprise to me is that all the responses were positive about having sixth grade in the middle school. Um, Schools use different models, just to, a little bit of information on that. Some schools have them fully integrated in a middle school team model where there's four, four core teachers on a team, very similar to our grade seven, eighth, um, safe, seventh and eighth grade model. Some schools have a more modified model where there's two teachers. Uh, one teacher teaches math and science. One teacher teaches language arts or English and social studies. Um, so it's like a, a smaller version of that. Um, and there was some variations within those two. Those are the two kind of big groupings. Um, several... Districts made the change in the last 10 years, Draken and Randolph in particular. Uh, one of those districts shared the quote that stood out to me is, uh, while we were said we were a middle school before adding sixth grade, we now realize we were a junior high school before that shift. So um, it was just an interesting piece of feedback and um, a little more than I was expecting, frankly, in terms of the level of responses I got and, and details. So that was helpful information to me. So I want to go into, the, again, the rationale for exploring a grade 6 through 8 model, not making our school a 6 through 8. And I know I'm banging, I continue to bang that drum, but I think, um, again, uh, I want to be really clear. So from a curricular perspective, uh, and some of this you all know and have heard before, um, we have a math report with recommendations around that. Our state frameworks are, are in grade 6 through 8 bands. 
uh, opportunities for earlier start in world language and other elective programs, which we've heard from the community. There's a strong interest in starting before seventh grade. Um, there's a lack of continuity for grades six through eight staff. You'll hear later that Mr. Sheehan's working very hard to think about the math report and responding in a grade six through eight way. And frankly, it's really hard with students in lots of different places to even have that conversation. Uh, and then finally, the content load. I was a sixth grade teacher. Uh, at that grade level, it's, it is challenging to teach as many subjects as some of our teachers are teaching. Um, and um, that's a challenge from a curricular basis. Most elementary school teachers like I was had one course in math methods in all of my teacher prep courses. And most of it is focused typically on the primary or kind of middle grade levels at the elementary school. There's not a tremendous amount of training that our teachers, elementary teachers receive on teaching fifth and sixth grade mathematics and science. Second uh, rationale, piece of rationale is um, deepening the middle school community and continuity and relationships. Again, none of this is a critique of our current middle school staff or families or um, do a wonderful job. But there are comments that are made pretty often about the middle school being a transition school because you transition in in seventh grade and then students transition to high school after eighth grade. And that, that's a structural challenge. It's not a, about the people who do a wonderful job with this, managing and supporting students in those transitions. Uh, and one of the things that, that I know from research and I've heard in the community is that it's hard to build relationships when you're a student's only in a school for two years. And we think about the achievement gap and the importance of students building that one-on-one -on -one relationship where if X happens, they have an adult they can go to. For some students, uh, they can walk into a school and find that adult very quickly. And for other students, that gets developed over the course of years and, and not so much months. Um, and so one of the things to, that f is important to me when we think of uh, opportunity gaps in our schools is, are there structural barriers right now that might shift uh, if our, some of our structures shifted? And I think that's another reason I think this is worth exploring. The third reason is that we have declining enrollment. You all know this and you've seen the enrollment projections. So our projected enrollment in 22-23 is 398 students um, from the NESDAQ report, the most recent one that was, just came in a month or two ago. That's about a two-thirds capacity of the school building. So uh, we have concerns. I have concerns about in inefficient energy usage. It's a lot of heating and cooling. Uh, one of the things you'll see in the latest, in that final report from JCJ is they did explore based on community feedback, could you like mothball a hallway, right? We have this extra space in the middle school and it's not designed well to be able to do that and you still have pipes that could burst and um, it's not a wing of the school that you sort of can close off because of the design. Um, so even if we, we aren't at close to full capacity, it's not like we can realize much energy savings that way. Um, in an inefficient space usage, you know, as I just mentioned. And then once we start getting down to under 400 students, we start getting into some difficult budgetary decisions because uh, when we get down below, two, right now we have two and a half teams. If that number continues to fall, then we get down to two teams and then uh, really some of our elective offerings, there's not necessarily the students to fill the seats in them. And so we have wonderful elective <coughs> offerings. That's one of the things that's incredibly important to our community. Um, and just, I am concerned about the future um, just based on the declining enrollment that we have. And uh, I wouldn't, and you've heard me say this before, I'm not one who um, advocates for huge increases of school choice students to fill, to make new seats, really to fill the empty seats that are there. Um, so it's a concern. And lastly, there's developmental considerations, all the way, going all the way back to Piaget, and um, there's a hyperlink on the slide. Um, to adolescent development that there really is, the thought is that there is this thing called early, early adolescence where um, students are out of that kind of what's called middle childhood age where there are real developmental shifts that happen around age, and age 11 and 12. Some of that's biological, some of that's puberty related. Um, some of that from a Piaget perspective are really academic and cognitively related that aren't necessarily uh, about the puberty piece. And so I think it, it is worth exploring where the best place to educate 11 and 12 year olds are. And that's really the core question for me. Is that, is that a middle school environment? Is that an elementary school environment? Uh, and what, what do we want for those students? Uh, what's in the best interest of those students? Um, I think um, <coughs> Mr. Donez and Mr. Demling were with the commissioner and I uh, back in November or December, um, walking into a sixth grade classroom in one of, our, one of the elementary schools that feeds into this district. And the first question students chose to ask is sort of why are we here? 
why are we in an elementary school setting, which he wisely turned to us and said, it's not me. Um, but um, I do think having students' opinion and student voice in that matter is going to be critically important as we move forward. And there are a lot of concerns to be analyzed. So the first is, what is that academic model? What do we think is the best interest of 11, 12-year-olds about how they're taught? Uh, if it was a six to eight model, would they be sort of the integrated in, or what level do we want them having their own unique experience? The second concern I've heard is that bullying and role models, right? So there's older students there. Are they at an impressionable age where being with students who are further along in their adolescence, you know, could have a negative uh, impact? And the last one is just the governance models. As we know, this is a seven through 12 regional district, and um, opening that door, there's going to be a lot of questions as to do all towns want to participate, do some towns want to participate. In either scenario, how does that actually functionally work within our governance system? So uh, proposed timeline, um, and then I'll get into the process. I went back and forth on the slides, but I actually want to start with the timeline because I think it sets a better context for the process. So what I'd like to start is, is next month um, to keep this ball rolling that has been started a couple months ago with the facilities use study. So uh, have about an eight, nine month study of program models um, and then have, bring that back to you in February of next year uh, with a consultant supporting the work and a community engaged process. Excuse me. Um, spicy food for dinner and it just, you know, doesn't work well for speaking right after. It's a my lesson. Um, and then really for that process um, then to come back to this body, and for you all to weigh, is this worth bringing to towns? Um, is this a, something that the regional school committee says, no, we, we don't want to go down this road. We don't want to engage the communities. Uh, we saw the model. It's not, not an interest of the region. That's fine. We've then exhausted our possibilities. We've gained a lot of information. And my hope would be actually we'd get a lot of information that could support our 7th and 8th grade programming. So I don't see this as all about the 6th grade. I see it about how do we think about what education do we want for our 11 to 14-year-old students? What does that look like? And then coming up with models that support that. So I see this as both looking at the sixth grade, but also kind of having some opportunity to think about middle school students in general. You, you talked about, yeah. <coughs> or Mr. Machine talked about previously, that the timing of really digging into uh, achievement gap challenges at the middle school level was something where, unlike looking at the, the curriculum that might be adopted this fall for math, that was something that is going to take a little, is, there's things can be done now, but it's still going to take a little longer. When you're looking at this process of exploration, is that also the kind of thing that will at least be aligned with this work or included? I, absolutely. Sexually? Yeah, and Mr. Sheen will be heavily, yeah. He knows he'll be heavily involved in this work because there's, <coughs> there's ramifications for the curriculum. You know, there, there's, it's a two-way street, this conversation about what's the structure, what's the meta structure. And then uh, how does the achievement gap go as it relates to teaching and learning? So um, if the regional school committee wants, chooses to engage the four communities, um, it can certainly choose to do so. And spring 2020, it seems like a logical time to at least start that engagement process. Um, and then we really want to give time for the towns to make a decision, at least a first decision, because it could be the case that some towns, town or towns choose to go and other towns say, well, if there's an on-ramp a couple years from now, like, keep that open. That's not a decision. That's me. Sorry. How will a town decide? Is it a town meeting? Is it a vote? Or what, what, how? Can I answer that question at the end of the slide? Because I think I'll, yeah, I mean, that's the right question. There's multiple answers to that question. So sure. um, I think mm -hmm. the answer right now is it depends, and hopefully I'll have a better answer about 90 seconds from now. Um, and then if towns decide to change their models of sixth grade education, financial and governance agreements have to be sorted through, right? So there's one example which would be, to Mr. Minot's point, town meetings would have to amend a regional agreement in one model. Another model would be a rental agreement that would really be the regional school committees to sort through. Um, and the elementary school committees would certainly need to be involved. So there's multiple players at this, in multiple seats at the table for elected officials uh, to play that out. I don't want to pretend that one of those is better than the other now, because I think it'd be uh, way too preliminary. Uh, we're not, I'm not in a place to... Part of it's structural it too, right? Depends Absolutely. on what's being done. Right. If all four towns choose to make this decision, that changes it versus if one town or two towns want it, or three towns even want to make it. So that's, I think, 
there's too many variables that are unknown at the moment. So the, the point I want to be clear, and that's it's why it's underlined, though I don't love this style of formatting, but I wanted to be really clear that the earliest I could see any change happening would be the fall of 2021. Um, and it could be the case that is a reasonable timeline for some communities if they chose to to make a change. It could be the case that it takes longer because that second to last bulleted point about education finance, really the financial and the governance piece takes longer than we're anticipating. Um, but I know people uh, oftentimes in the community want to know what's the earliest you could see this happening. So I wanted to at least put up a slide. I can't see it happening earlier than the fall of 2021. Yeah. And not to put a fine point on it, but based on the way you're describing it, even, I mean, many times probably after the first iteration of engagement with the regional school committee that you described there, there would have to be additional discussions and presentations just with the regional committee to understand. I know it sounds funny because I guess all of us sit on both, depending on what town you're from. Um, so it's a weird thing to say, but at one point you have your hat on as the regional school committee, and we got to say what's really the implication for our operations, for our budget, for the, the, these buildings and facilities. And then you put the other hat on and say, is this something I want to do? And there are going to be a, other, a number of moments, my point is, between February 20 and winter 2021 or something, in which you'd undoubtedly have to come back to this body to update and have a conversation about how do these, however the proposals are shaking out, if it were to happen, what are the implications, pure and simple, for the regional yeah. district? Absolutely. Yeah. And one of the things that I want to also comment on, and, and one of the reasons I felt really clean, because we had conversations with the chairs of, of multiple committees, is that this was a good topic for the regional meeting, is that uh, one of the things I heard from superintendents is the a clear clear warning, don't just focus on the impact in sixth grade. Actually, think about the impact on seventh and eighth graders, because it, it functionally changes the school. Yeah. Uh, and whether that's good or bad, we, we don't know, right? We can only go from models we develop. But that the focus can't just be on sixth grade, it's actually on the school. And what do we want for the school? And then drill down to the different grade levels. But it's not like you, you add a grade level of students and everyone else is unaffected. That's, that's not a realistic scenario. That's not what we'd want. Do you want to wait for questions until the end? I'm very... Okay, so um, just a clarifying question. Yeah. So one, one thing I'm, I'm not understanding from the May 2019 to the February 2020 phase uh -huh. is if, if that's all regional school committee only and there's no involvement from the school committees, um, the four potential school committees that include sixth grade, the... The, the 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 problem I'm 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 seeing is if like say if say you're giving us an update here or I'm participating in one of these working groups or whatever, and a concern comes up uh, or a benefit comes up for sixth graders, I can't talk about that because none of us on this committee in our roles in this role have any responsibility for the education of sixth grade students, right? And like we we own the building, and we have responsibility for the seventh and eighth grade education, but not for the sixth grade, and so. It, to wait until February 2020, maybe I'm confused about what your vision is, sure. but to wait to February 2020 to have input up from a sixth grade responsibility perspective seems really late. Yeah, so um, I think the engagement would have to go beyond the regional school committee before February 2020, I agree with you. It's just, since it's a regional building and be talking about expanding the grade levels in a regional building, I wanted to start it here, but that's why I met with Jen Haggerty that's so why she's planning on updating the Leverett and Shootsbury school committees, and I've done the same in Pelham and will continue to do it. Um, I think I had a hard time imagining, and I'm open to feedback from the committee, uh, how often we're going to get five school committees together to talk about this on a regular basis. You know, I think that was something that was hard for me to think about, two of which I don't work for. Okay, so two things. Yeah. One, I'm going to go through a couple questions, and then we probably want to get through the rest of the presentation because sure. we're going to run up against the deadline for this item. Mr. Menino, then Ms. Aronis. I think it's a related question. Your presentation talks about some of the benefits of moving the sixth grade. How are you going to find out what's currently being done and the current outputs? Because unless, what if we, we gain something but we lose more? I don't know what that more is because I don't know how you define the outputs of the current configuration. Yeah, I'll briefly answer. So I think that's part of the study is what's the program model, and again, reimagining what do we want for students 11 through 14 years old. And it might be that we want for 11 and 12 years, it's exactly what they have. That's entirely possible, and that could be a reasonable outcome that 
a group comes up with. Uh, but I think asking the question is worthwhile for me. Ms. Hernandez? Just a quick question. Uh, so we started this meeting. We were talking about town meetings. Yeah. And uh, the fact that you know Amherst doesn't have one anymore, but the other towns do, uh, changes, I think, a little bit sometimes some of these kinds of timelines, yeah. right? So you mentioned fall 2020 as when the towns would actually decide. Um, but I, I'm not sure about the other towns in the district. I know for Amherst this was the case that there were only certain types of, of topics that were taken up or issues that were taken up at certain town meetings. So I would just be wary of mm -hmm. putting down that one date. Mm -hmm. It might be fall 2020, it might actually be spring 2021 for a decision like that once the information comes back, unless a special town meeting is called, but I can't imagine that being the case for something like this. Anyway, just you know, mm -hmm. in thinking about this timeline and communicating that back out to the public and to the individual towns, um, I don't know that we can actually put a hot, you know, sort of a, an actual date on that, like that. Yeah, and I think making a more general date makes sense. I mean, Pelham does have a fall town meeting, uh, old discontinuous town meeting, I think, right? Um, in the same location. Um, it's a very small town meeting. It is. Um, but um, I think it's an open question whether town meetings, the decision maker, it depends on, there's too many right. variables. So exactly. I think... To your point, I think it's a good one in making that date more uh, flexible. It's just on. not an absolute date. It's yeah. Absolute date. Yeah, yeah. Move, yeah. Right? No, that's really helpful. Uh, I agree. Great. So you know what I'd love to do? Um, keep going with the rest of your, since we actually basically went through half of it. Yeah. And then we asked a bunch of questions. Yeah. Because it asked me to do the same thing and have the discipline to save up again, including me. So I think I started this ball wrong. Until <laughs> 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 yeah. you're done, and then we'll jump back in. Yeah, there's only four more slides, so it should be <laughs> brief. Um, and so uh, I've already engaged. Um, they wanted to have an articulated plan to share with you. Uh, there's an organization called the Association for Middle Level Education. So they're a national organization for middle level education. They're based in Ohio, as lovely as Ohio is. You know, I'd rather work with someone a little more local who knew Massachusetts and, and just from a cost perspective, frankly, as well. And so they do have a consultant who's relatively local, Juan Rodriguez. He's a former middle, Massachusetts principal of the year. and. Um, he was a middle school principal in Framingham, which is a diverse community. He also was an elementary principal and was involved in a school where, that added sixth grade. So he had a, a skill set that seemed very appropriate for what we're trying to do. I was also incredibly impressed in speaking about him, about kind of the types of things that need to be considered and thought through as one would uh, be considering the, the pros and cons of this, uh, of a model. So um, it was really helpful. And, and again, it was his frame that I repeat something I said earlier is that you want this process to end where even if sixth grade doesn't move, you've still learned a lot throughout the process that's still going to inform and improve your uh, the education that our middle level students are, are receiving. And so I think that's really important because, you know, who knows where to lead, but we want to, if we're going to put resources, time and funds into it, we want it to be positive no matter what the outcome is. And so really the goal was to define what education, as I said, we want for middle level students um, and what the model would look like if sixth graders were included in the middle school. And I think I'm going to read them out loud, although I try not to read too much of my slides. Um, but the key topics, and this is really in conversations with Mr. Rodriguez, was communication about the potential move with separate communities and stakeholders, understanding that each community, and by community I'm referring to town at this point, is going to have a different set of variables and different set of circumstances and perhaps different set of um, matrices to make decisions by. Um, I really want to think of three areas, the academic, the social, emotional, and the procedural. Uh, all of those need equal... Um, kind of airtime and equal planning, that budgeting, staffing, budget, staffing, space, and resources, like how do we actually articulate what that would look like. Uh, academic program of studies and preparing the middle school for the sixth grade arrival, so this is if we are moving forward, how would one actually map that out so that that first year, that second year, we have an articulated plan and transition plan for students and for staff. <coughs> um, and then again, the transition program for the sixth grade, um, because you'd be, presumably staff would be transitioning as well as students. Um, so what we tried to do, because I think it, frankly, it worked so well, it was, in, it was the advice of this committee to come up with an advisory board to start this process. And I think we've heard from members of that board and Mr. Cassins and I have spoken about it, that we'd want to um, have meetings once a month from, and we tried to pick a time where students, in particular students, could be involved in this process. So we tried to say three to seven. Um, and what we'd like to include is four to five students uh, in the district. At first, this is some of the feedback I received from principals. We were thinking of middle school students, particularly seventh grade students, because they'll be in middle school next year. 
And some of the feedback I received from principals is really want to be more open, that if there's high school students who want to participate, that's great, and they might actually have a broader set of experiences to draw from. And if there was a way to get elementary students there at 3 o'clock, then we can try to do that too. Uh, the alternative idea was to have sort of focus groups at the elementary level as the process continues, which is probably logistically the more likely scenario. That I would participate, that uh, I'd love to have one or two school committee members participate. Uh, we'd certainly need a human resources person. Again, that staffing piece is talking to other superintendents is particularly challenging around not just licensure, but interest and, and having an HR person there from the beginning would be helpful. Uh, we'd love to have five administrators, six to eight staff members, and six to eight parents and guardians. Um, you can see that's inclusive of Union 26, which is, just for people who don't know, that's the Amherst and Pelham Supervisory Union. Union 28 is the supervisory union that Leverett and Shutesbury are in, and then the region. Um, we'd also want to, for staff, have one member selected by the, the Teachers Association. Um, I think it's worth noting, too, in my conversation with Ms. Haggerty, and she's not offering an opinion on this, but in some of our other elementary schools that feed into middle schools, there are mixed models where some towns have their sixth grade in their elementary and others don't, and they feed into a middle school at different points. So this is not something that is um, atypical or never happens. Um, it certainly does. And, and talking to Ms. Hag Superintendent Haggerty was really helpful in just thinking through some of those steps. But she's been a willing participant in communicating with the Shutesbury and Leverett communities uh, on the topic. And really, last slide is just the intended outcome is engage the community on this, uh, develop a model that the community, the larger community can then say, this is good, or what about this, and, and really have a dynamic process that way. Try to get something back to the region in the winter of 2020, uh, and then we'll see what steps are taken after that. But really, the first step is just engaging, having community members come together, reimagine or imagine what this might look like, and put pencil to paper and actually get something written down for people to respond to. Uh, at this point, people have very visceral responses in my, in my, my experience. I'm like, people think it's a good idea or a bad idea, and um, I don't really have a vision of what it would look like. So I, don't, I, I hear all that and I take it in, but I, I think it would be more helpful for the communities actually to have something for them to respond to that's, that's tangible. And that'd be the goal. Great. Uh, start around, move around the table with uh, any questions or comments? At this point, comments as well. Anyone ask? Oh, uh, crap. Um, I'm having a I'll come back. I'll come <laughs> back to no, I'm, I'm having a hard time. Like my my learning disability is starting. To, I need <laughs> my I need my accommodations. My IEP, and my liaison sitting here because <laughs> my mom is over here, the town is over here, and then I'm I'm over here with my own thoughts, and it's just <laughs> trying to hold them all together. It's really hard. You can but, offer them from but, any any one of them you want to pick. <laughs> I'm going to start with my mom. <laughs> so my, my mom was a, um, a middle school home ec teacher for 20 something or 18 years and I can remember almost every night when she came home she said I wish they would put those, it was a 6th six, six to 8th grade model which I survived along with my three siblings and um, she felt that the 6th graders belonged in the middle school but they really needed to be treated differently and in their own space because she felt that they weren't ready to just be thrown in with the seventh and eighth graders. And in Marshfield, where I grew up, there were five elementary schools that fed into two middle schools that were split up by the alphabet. And I, oh, also Lawrence O'Brien, who was a former chair of this committee, he survived that also. <laughs> but so my mom, she felt that it was good to have the sixth graders in the middle school, but really have them separate for, for, for the most part from the seventh and eighth graders. And the town of Shutesbury, I know that for a long time they, they were adamant that no, we need to hold on to our sixth graders. But the last two years at every single school committee meeting in Shutesbury, the principal is reminding us, because there's a number of us that have been on the committee for a while, that Shutesbury is changing. That the, uh, it's, the town is like in flux or in transition. That the older families that were hanging tight to the old traditions, most of those families are now gone. And it's a whole new batch. And the... Uh, Shutesbury may, I mean, I can't speak for the town at this point, but it's more likely now 
or in 2022 than it would have been even six years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll come, come back to my myself. I yeah. Okay. Uh, Ms. Pena? Oh, this is a hard one for me. Uh, I'm not your mother, uh, but I've seen the sixth grade for 45 years in the town of Bellum. And I stand outside the door three times a week for 15 minutes while they transition. And, and imagining those kids in a middle school is beyond my comprehension. Um, starting with the backpack would be heavier than most of the kids. Uh, um, I've made this point before. Uh, I still, I know you're going to, you know, consider the issues, but uh, how do you protect the sixth graders from the eighth graders? You mentioned mixing them up. Did they take the same courses, uh, or the sixth graders should be separate from the seventh and eighth graders? I thought they maybe only shared a lunchroom if. They did normal class lobbying. Um, but most importantly, the consultant. It's going to be a fact gathering. I, I hope you consider them asking a question that would require them more than spending a perfunctory 15 to 20 minutes at an elementary school and then walk away with a recommendation upon the future of that, uh, of that elementary school when the math group, to my knowledge, only spent 15 to 20 minutes at Bellum School and made a decision, uh, which I find uh, somewhat questionable. Uh, and uh, I just think they're too small. <laughs> they're too small to go to middle school. Mr. Um, so in terms of the actual question of the item, is this worthy to explore? Yes, for the reasons you cited, I won't belabor them. Um, my, my, my concern really is, is with the, the question I brought up before about when and at what level you opt to engage the four pre-K to six districts. Um, and I'm being very conscious that right now I have my 7 to 12 hat on, but there's this other pre-K to six hat there that I'm not going to put on right now, so I'm just talking about the process. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this, this, the goal slide of intended outcome of the developed models for consideration. If, if you get to that point and there hasn't been full involvement of, of all constituents, all parents, guardians, school committee members of those potential um, feeding districts of sixth grade, then, then that's going to feel like it was, it was baked before they got there. So, so that asterisk that you have on the um, participants um, on, on a few of those items, I think should be on all of those items. And, and, and I, I really think that it has to be approached with the intention of um, being as having as those committees involved as, as much as possible, you know, it, it may involve some cumbersome joint meetings, may involve a lot of cumbersome joint meetings, and, and that may slow down the process. But if that's what has to happen, I think that's what that's what has to happen. Um, I I can see myself getting very frustrated if I'm having uh, a meeting at our region and I see that pre K to six hat there and I can't put it on and just having to bite my tongue. It's going to feel really bothersome that I can't have that engaged discussion uh, until you know the, the winter comes and things are more or less done. So that's my main piece of input. Um, I just wanted to add um, that I think it does make sense. You know, I would support uh, continued investigation of this. I'm not going to take a position on whether or not I think it's, it's the right um, model to pursue yet, because I think for all the reasons you stated, it's too soon. Um, but I, I think you've presented plenty of evidence that we should. Um, especially compelling to me is just the, the declining enrollment and the concern about having, I mean, I, like I, I was there when it was the three grades, and I've been there recently, and it just it feels different when it's emptier, and I think that's an important thing to think about. And I think if, if we've been deciding we're not going to be moving <laughs> folks up to the high school, then we really are stuck with the dilemma, and I think taking action now is the way to do it and getting as much information as we can. So thank you. Um, so I, I also would echo and say, yes, I think this is definitely worth exploring. Um, and I like that approach, that phrasing, because in anything, you, we have to explore it before we make any decisions anyway. Um, but I would echo very strongly what um, Mr. Demling was citing, is that um, a, a 
about this is as much a regional decision as it is the elementary decision. And gavel me if I'm breaking protocol here. I, I don't even imagine that I could even separate consideration of a, from a sixth grader's perspective from the building perspective. And I think to separate that out as we get the updates throughout the year of, of exploration is really looking at this complex um, idea from one side and a very handicapped one side. And I think um, it, it's, it, it's as much going to benefit the overall school and impact the seventh and eighth graders, but okay, this might be I'm wearing my elementary hat, but I see you know impacting the sixth graders almost more, if not um, you know at least equally to impacting the seventh and eighth graders and the experience in the school building itself. So I strongly agree that the exploration committee and the advisory committee should include representatives from each, and I wonder if there's some sort of steering committee, maybe pulling from the model that you have with the Amherst and Pelham Elementary Regionalization Board that might pull from the representative town elementary committees and create a group that is so that we don't have to have these cumbersome update meetings and then those folks have the responsibility of updating their respective mm. committees. But it, there, there has to be a way to solve both and um, that we don't get caught up in the bureaucracies and of our peculiar governance structures. So I think, uh, I think this is worth pursuing. Uh, and I actually, uh, I'm not putting on another hat. It happened at a public meeting. Um, at a public meeting the other day, um, the, the president of the Amherst Town Council raised, raised the question of, you know, aren't we, you know, talking about our elementary schools um, and possible expansions of them, said, well, aren't we going to just move the sixth grade to the middle school um, so if we're doing that, why are we talking about different models of expansion at the elementary level? And um, colleague to the left had a lot of good things to say, but one of the things that I said about it was that um, that no, that actually that's not what we're doing. We're actually I understand there's a concept or a model out there. Um, there's been a strong argument made for it, but that what we're trying to do is sincerely structure a process in which. Um, <coughs> whatever sort of energy or momentum appears to be existing for an idea, that it is being sincerely vetted, thoroughly thought through from multiple different angles, uh, and is going to engage the whole community. Because one of the comments I made is, you know, I can tell you, I kind of made, said then was, I can tell you for a fact the superintendent doesn't know that he wants to do this or to recommend this. Uh, but then I also said, even if uh, he and his colleagues in, in central office and elsewhere uh, went into a room and decided it was a good idea. It it is deeply meaningful, as a as a as a as a as an actual substantive input into the process. What the rest of the staff would say at different levels, what members of the public would say, what parents would say, what students think, and it's not it's not it's not a good idea until you have all of those elements together and synthesized in a way. And the only way you can do that is if you build trust that it is being done authentically and really it's not you know that there's no freight train moving um but but on the other hand i also like the idea that if a good idea is come up with and it is mixed around a little bit and makes sense then yeah we're gonna do it you know what i mean like the and so there's cognitive dissonance right you're trying to keep two things in your head at the same time it's it's an idea to explore it's not baked the conversation analysis is real but if it, if it ends up being a good idea, it's not, this is not just an exercise. It's being done to actually improve our schools and their operations. Um, I know that we are sometimes tortured here by the language we use and the substance that we discuss because of the different committees that we sit on. Um, and I know this is hard, but you gotta, you gotta figure this out. Mm -hmm. Because um, I don't, I don't, nobody needed to be gaveled because if we're here talking about a regional school that has a sixth grade in it, you can't be gaveled for talking about the sixth grade because the plan potentially would be for a sixth grade in the middle school. So it's germane, right? Um, but I also understand that if there are countervailing principles that would, or arguments that would lead you to say that that isn't the case, you'd immediately feel itchy, right? You'd feel like, well, I can't really argue for the current model unless I feel like I'm putting that hat back on again. So. Uh, either uh, uh, Juan, uh, your 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 uh, consultant and expert, 
or you or someone else has got to figure this out. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't make any it doesn't make any sense to go a, you know close to a year yeah. without it fully. And also, I'm going to say something even more provocative. I don't think you mean that, no. and I don't think you intend that. <laughs> so just come back to us with a model that we think works. So I just wanted to say thank you for, for bringing this to the committee. I, I uh, actually do also agree that it's important to explore this topic. Um, I think from the moment that I got on school committee, probably not too long after joining school committee, I started hearing from community members telling me repeatedly that they felt like their sixth graders were too old, quote unquote, to be in the elementary school. And it came about as a, you know, a reflection um, regarding the previous, you know, building project that happened here in Amherst around the schools. Um, but just, I think the community has been thinking about that for some time, right? And for me, it's, you know, it, it is a sort of a novel idea, because I grew up in a K through eight uh, model, you know, where by the time you got to eighth grade, wow, you were so ready to leave. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you were also, I think, in many ways felt uh, kind of responsible for these younger children that you were, you know, sort of keeping an eye on. So I can see how all of those different models can work. Um, I do think that it is important to have uh, you know, various milestones throughout this process and during this timeline that accurately reflect how people are going to be engaged. You know, we've talked about this before. All these documents become public documents and people will start reacting to it when they hear something. Uh, but I actually took away from this that not that you were going to be excluding the you know, individual elementary school committees, but rather that it was going to be something presented to the regional school committee, because that's the conversation that we're having tonight with the regional school committee. So I think I understood that from this. Um, but I think, again, for, you know, for all the purposes stated, it probably helps to, or definitely helps to have those other touch points included in there. Um, I am a little bit concerned about uh, the at this point the way that you described all of this and from the conversations that I've had with you know some educators and even uh, administrators in this district and other districts about our or anyone's ability really to bring something to fruition in just a year and a half or two years uh, it feels like a very short amount of time to make such a massive you know curriculum change and structure infrastructure change and you know uh, systems changes like we're talking about um, but again, I think that the whole point of this is to have an exploration to better understand what's possible, what's feasible. I have to say that I really appreciate the, uh, the advisory board that you've outlined here and making sure that we have various staff, which I understand to be educators yes. and others in the district, um, also including parents and guardians. So there is actually quite a bit of input beyond just one consultant and a superintendent. And that's actually incredibly important to highlight that you know this is not a process where one or two people will be making a decision or even a body of nine people, but really this will be you know the way that you've outlined here. We could probably flesh it out even more yeah. during the, the process. You know, you're talking about a significant number of people whose ideas and opinions and experience will be weighing in on whether or not we decide to move forward with this. So I really appreciate you putting this in here. I really appreciate the way that you're thinking about this, and I think it's a good idea to explore it. Ms. Gustinson? Um, yeah, I also support continued exploration of this topic. And um, like some of my other school committee members, I would support um, earlier involvement of elementary school committee members. You know, and let me just elaborate on something because I think it combines a few of these comments and something that Mr. Jones just said. Um, and what I hinted at, where I said I suspected you were going to have more engagement. Part part of what I, I mean, if there's something substantive, that's great that you're coming up with around how to engage the different committees in the community. But one thing I'd say is, even though I respect how you framed this presentation today, I would argue that when you're if you're doing a dog and pony show on this. Um, this effort is harmed by being overly hermetic. Mm -hmm. It actually is helped by showing what, I mean, even if we then, the chair has a heavy responsibility to them to say, no, 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 I see it on the slide too, don't talk about it. Um, I would rather go that direction than, than get into a conversation in which you might very well opine, no, 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 I've got all sorts of stuff planned with the Amherst Committee, I just don't want to talk about it tonight because this is a regional meeting. It's like that, that all that does is sow public confusion yeah, yeah, about yeah. what's going on. That's sort of what I, I didn't, you were getting at it more clearly than I was. That's sort of what I was saying, you got to figure it out. Yeah. And, and you can do that with the chairs or, or right. whomever, is, is how to make sure that people are seeing the whole picture, even if at a particular meeting we're only talking about one p part of the 
puzzle. That makes sense. It does. Okay. Do you have anything to say back to all this? Um, I mean, I wanted to get through it because no, otherwise we could take another hour yeah. if we just dribbled it through. I think I just have two or three quick comments. So I think one thing I want to be clear on, because I realize it wasn't before based on the comments, is that the consultant wouldn't be charged with making a recommendation. There's not a math report where someone we're asking someone to look at our programs. The consultant's charge would be actually to facilitate this group to come up with models for the consideration of the community, not to make a recommendation. So I want to be, I didn't say that before, but, but based on feedback, I want to make sure, or comments, I want to make sure that's really clear. I agree about kind of how to engage the elementary committees, and that's why I met with, you know, Ms. Haggerty and perhaps Mr. Sullivan and, and whoever replaces Ms. Kaczynski will be good conduits to those because I'm in Amherst and Pelham with the elementary communities. Just So I think it's worth saying. So there's an imbalance, right? Because for the Amherst and Pelham school committees, I have like, super access, right? And we meet regularly. I'm connected in all sorts of ways with those committees. And with Leverton and Shootsbury, it's not the same. And so uh, the challenge for me, and challenge I'll have to work out, I agree, is how to engage the Shootsbury and Leverett school committees at the right level. Um, and um, because I don't have any quote unquote right uh, to be engaging them. I mean, in any like technical sense, I mean, not that they're opposed, I'm sure. And hopefully Mr. Sullivan would Make again and be a warm host as he always is. But um, so I think that is a little bit of the challenge is how to engage four elementary committees, two of which know me, I know them, we work regularly, we have logical times and agendas that we can talk about this, and two that I don't. So, you know, in addition to chairs, I think, particularly for the Shootspan Leverett representatives, I think just outreach to figure out what's <laughs> happened in addition with their superintendent, but with the committee members is going to be really important. Right. And that's all actually I'd like to. Okay. Share. Then, uh, we're going to move on, unless you wanted to express your own opinion briefly. Uh, I'll just say that I, I like the I, I really like the idea, having spent five years in the Shrewsbury Elementary School and being a, a licensed elementary school teacher, pre, you know, pre-K through six, and also infant toddler through pre-K through the early ed, um, that I s struggled with watching the sixth graders being, at, speaking to your point, the sixth grade, at least in Shootsbury, the sixth graders are treated exactly the same as the preschoolers. They have to line up the exact same, you know, exact, instead of letting them line up by themselves at recess and bring themselves in, they have to, just like, pre, just like preschool and kindergarten, they have to wait and they do the exact same model that the entire, where they really need to be let go so that they can grow and expand. Um, so, and the other thing is that I'm going to have to find a way in Shootsbury, the school committee, the superintendent's update is just before the regional school committee members. So I have to figure out a way that I can speak to this first before the superintendent of Union 28 gets to it on next Thursday. Okay. Sure. So it's, it's going to be a conversation monthly in Shootsbury. Great, great. Uh, great. So we'll we'll okay. we'll stay tuned and keep engaged. Um, we're so we're running behind, um, but I have a feeling we're going to pick up speed. <laughs> I don't mean on this item. This item is really, <laughs> as much time as you want. Uh, math report follow, follow up. So pressure. <laughs> I feel like I have to talk like this. No, no, no. Like no, one no, of those no. announcers at the end of a like a pharmaceutical commercial <laughs> gets all the legal stuff out there. <laughs> all right, good evening. Well, I can actually say on the last topic that I grew up in Holyoke and I was the very last class that did grades seven and eight in a junior high school. The transition was happening around us. I started in seventh grade. And that year, the ninth graders got pushed out. And then when I moved up to eighth, the sixth graders came in behind us. So we were sort of this oddity where we were a junior high model class with middle school following us behind in the same building. You should have lots of opinions to share. With you. <laughs> yeah, it could be. That was 1989 or something like that. 1999. <laughs> All right. Well, good evening. I'm here to talk with you about math again. Um, and this, my, at least my part of the presentation, should be briefer than 
uh, the last time and probably won't have anything new to say until sometime in May after this point. Um, so I've been very busy with math lately. Um, so just to sort of get you up to speed. Can yes. I just actually do the yeah. framing piece again? Oh, sure, sure. So this is really, uh, as a f and, and I know Mr. Shannon will get this, but really the goal for this is to update the committee on the process that's being used. Um, uh, kind of on three topics, the high school curriculum, the middle school ma math, high school math curriculum, the middle school math curriculum, and then some of the achievement gap issues that were cited in the report. So that's the framing and purpose of this, is that the committee gets that, um, those particular pieces of information, I haven't asked any questions, uh, but it's primarily about the process. There's not going to be, mm -hmm. oh yeah, we made this decision, right? That's not the goal of tonight. Since I snapped about it earlier, I apologize for not snapping at Mr. Shane. I should have asked. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> please continue. So, and I did say to Dr. Morris earlier today that, and, and please feel free to to uh, to speak up. I've been steeped in all of this uh, for a while now, so there are some. Sometimes I get to talking, and I assume that other people know something because it's in my head. Um, so if I breeze, oops, if I breeze through something, and you're not sure what I'm talking about, shout. <laughs> uh, the math working group met last week. It was a very productive meeting. Dr. Morris joined us uh, for part of that time, and we, uh, reviewed a number of documents. And uh, the math working group is made up of teachers K through 12, um, administrators, um, as well as a parent guardian representative. Um, and so we looked at a theory of action document that that group had developed last year. We looked at some other vision type documents. Our elementary math specialists had been working off of sort of a, a simple but very instructive vision for their work for the last several years. We had some sample vision documents to look at and other things from the district that were helpful. Um, a good discussion about what are the essentials in math education? And some of those are regulatory. They come to us from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Some of those are part of what the fabric of what we do in Amherst. Um, and so the, it was a lot of discussion. It was sort of pouring everything out on the table. And then a smaller group volunteered to work on crafting a vision statement. Because one thing that was also very clear is that a group of 12 people was not going to be able to write something together. And so actually that group sent me just today, hot off the press, their draft of a vision statement, uh, which is not ready to, to share in this way. The, the larger group is now going over this for comments. Um, but they've, they've included it, really the gist of the conversation that we had and have done some good work. And so we're hoping to have another draft by the end of the week that will be instructive enough that we can move forward on other decisions based on that while we're vetting it with the larger faculty, uh, parents, guardians, school committee, and so forth. Mr. Holmes? Can I just ask a quick clarifying question? Maybe you mentioned this earlier here at the last meeting. Um, can you remind the, group, the committee who sits on this working group? Yes, it is. Um, I'm on this group. Um, Dr. Morris and Dr. Brady uh, are both sort of ex officio members of the group. Um, and then otherwise it is um, teachers from K through 12, so the elementary math specialists, that's three of them. Um, there are a couple of middle school teachers. Uh, there are a few high school teachers. Uh, Nancy Stewart, um, who's the president of the CPAC group. Um, and I think that pretty much captures the group. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, and so what I've done here me, is to try to break down the timeline for you with a little bit more detail than you've seen before and, and sort of taking out some of the other things that are not directly related to textbook selection. Um, and so this slide and the next one both have information about the high school component because you remember there's sort of two parallel processes going on here, the high school and the middle grades, grades six through eight. I'm trying not to say middle school because it does include grade six, in fact, um, going back to your previous conversation. Um, and so at this point, 
Uh, I've been in contact with publishers uh, as far as sort of getting some, doing some preliminary vetting um, and getting some material, sample material sent to us. And also, as of today, setting up times for publishers to do presentations to a uh, textbook review committee. Um, that committee is going to be, for the high school, be made up of the high school math faculty, um, including special ed teachers who teach math, um, as well as we're, we've reached out and we're uh, trying to assemble some parents to be a parents or guardians to be a part of this committee. I've reached out to some faculty in the high school about getting a couple of students to be part of this committee. Um, and so that committee, as it's formed, will then look at all the materials. The first step in that process, April 22nd and 23rd, is going to be to meet with the consultants from Looney Math, and they're going to help as far as framing the process of examining textbook materials. Um, so setting criteria, using the vision document to do that, using the Massachusetts Curriculum Frameworks for Mathematics to do so, um, using what they found in their review um, to help us guide that process. Because what we'll then be faced with is whenever you look at curriculum materials, you have very knowledgeable salespeople, essentially, who will come in or who will virtually show us what their product has to offer. Um, there are some resources that we've been using to narrow down choices, because as you can imagine, everybody publishes Algebra One textbooks. Um, so there's a, a website that you may want to look at at some point. It's called Ed Reports. Um, and this is an organization that is grant funded by some of the very large funders in, in the game, the Gateses and Hewlett Packard Foundation and so forth. And they have uh, been rating materials in math and language arts actually for the last several years. And it's not the end all, but it's a very helpful tool. Um, and in fact, you can sort it. And the first thing I did in looking at it was uh, sorted by high school texts and then sorted by um, alignment to the standards. And they use the Common Core State Standards, which the Massachusetts curriculum frameworks are based on. And that's sort of a quick way to get rid of a whole lot of options that just are not standards aligned. Um, and then you can start going through what is a very extensive um, study of the uh, curricula that publishers have submitted, and they have responses from publishers. So in places where they've sort of dinged somebody's textbook, they do give publishers the opportunity to respond. And those are equally instructive to read, because uh, there were some that I read and then read the publisher's response and said, mm, publisher has a point. Um, so there's a lot of good information to, to begin the process. And uh, Looney Math Consulting will help us as far as setting criteria um, to move forward from there. Mr. Devlin, do you have a question? Yeah, if, if there were parents or community members who were interested in serving on the textbook review committee, how would they, who sh should they get in touch with? Um, they can email me. Okay. Um, yep. And, and I should say if any school committee members want to participate in that, you can also email me. Um, it will be um, a, a compressed process. I mean, there will be time during the school day uh, or just after school gets out as far as, I mean, our, our time is limited as far as scheduling meetings. So I know for some people that will immediately mean that they're not available to participate in that process. Um, but we will also have a time where materials will be available for the public at large to uh, examine and give feedback on. Um, and that will probably be a combination of print materials that we can set up at the Jones Library and online access that some publishers now don't send sample materials the way they used to. Um, in, in order to cut their costs, they make things available online. Um, and that's sort of the way of the world at the moment. <coughs> uh, and I should also mention uh, that the math department has been collecting data as well. One of the math teachers over the weekend sent this extensive uh, spreadsheet. It really was amazing and very helpful. Uh, she had gone through and collected information on comparable high schools and and, and as a math teacher, she set a criteria for what would become a comparable high school and did a survey of high school's websites across the state and had sort of disqualifiers and, and broke it down into different course sequences and text materials and student demographics. And it really was, it was very interesting to read and helpful and, and has triggered some more ideas from there.
Uh, and so this is the next piece of the, uh, the process. And we're aiming for the end of May to, to have a recommendation to be able to bring to the superintendent um, with the intent of being able to get materials so that we can do some professional development with uh, staff after school gets out in June. Um, and that's something else we've made publishers aware of, that, that this is our timeline, and we would want at least the necessary materials to be able to do that. Again, now most everything is available online as well as in print, so that, that isn't as challenging as it may have been five or ten years ago. Mr. Menino? Are your recommendations in any way dependent on whether the sixth grade moves to the middle school or stays in the elementary school? No, not at all. Um, so I will say, though, that through part of this process with the, the middle grades portion of it, I'm also looking at ways to make sure that regardless of what happens with the study of where sixth grade is, is housed, that we have better connections between the faculty who teach math in the elementary schools and the faculty who teach math in the middle school. Uh, for lots of different reasons, because the curriculum is connected, because um, Dr. Morris alluded to it in his presentation, the secondary level teachers have content level knowledge that is more developed because that's all they teach, uh, where elementary teachers are generalists and their training is different. And so it really makes sense for someone at sixth grade to be able to interact with their colleagues at seventh and eighth, um, because there's knowledge sharing that, that needs to happen there. Very briefly, um, Mr. Shintz also uh, invited um, the curriculum coordinator, I'm not sure her title, from um, Shootsbury and Leverett from Union 28 to participate as much as they want, right? It's obviously not a decision that we would offer any recommendation for them, but at least they had the opportunity and there's a lot of willingness and interest in at least engaging to learn about this process and take advantage of the resources that are going to be used uh, in this process. Great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and as far as the middle school process, what right now what we're looking at is a slightly different process than the high school, and, and I believe that I mentioned it at the last meeting. Um, there's a, a resource that's available, this Open Up Resources uh, math curriculum that has been receiving very strong reviews by people who are knowledgeable in the field, and that's something that we're going to take a look, a more extensive look at right after the school vacation week. Um, get an introduction and have some time for uh, grade six to eight teachers to dig into it and see if that might be something that we want to go with for that middle level. Um, and normally we would never look into jumping into a curriculum without extensive vetting. The difference with this one is it's free. Um, and so there isn't a risk factor as far as spending tens of thousands of dollars. Um, now it's free, we wouldn't jump into something like that normally either, except I mentioned Ed Reports and there are other sources that have looked at this and it's, it's getting very strong responses. Um, and it's also being used by other school districts, so there's experience out there. Um, uh, Newton and Franklin in Massachusetts, I'm told, are already in their, at least their second year of implementation with it. And I got a list um, that had, a colleague in another town got from Desi of districts that have sort of in a pilot phase or exploring it, and it's there's about 10 different districts here, including Hamilton, Wenham, Acton, Boxborough, East Hampton, uh, Boston, Easton, Stoughton, Attleboro, um, and I spoke to the curriculum director in Northampton, and they're looking at it for their middle school. Um, so unlike some other things that that we've looked at in the past, that. It, there are actually peers that are using this uh, with experience. So if that's something that looks like it could fill the need, it's something that we could use and say for the next two years, we're going to spend a lot of time with this. And if during that time we decide this is not the curriculum for us, we can do a full textbook review. Um, now, it would be nice if this were this easy at the high school level. Um, and, and we'll see. It could be that the the teachers look at this the week after vacation and say this is not going to meet our needs, in which case we will shift gears into a different style of textbook review at the middle grades. So that, that's actually what I wanted to ask about. Is just a, I know you're going through it, but just a step back for two seconds. Mm -hmm. um, how are you going to decide? I mean, what, what's, 
the unlike most things we do and most things you've been describing and most things I'm hearing about, it's it, most of it's so incredibly you know stepped that mm -hmm. you basically you, the one thing you're guaranteed is no one's making a decision anytime soon. Um, and this is sort of like not that that's a bad thing, but it's sort of just true. Um, this is sort of like all of a sudden the reverse. It sounds right. like something that sounds it's, like almost like a decision that's already been made, but you're going to take a couple steps to think about it. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering about how you do your due diligence and assure yourself in this next period of a couple of weeks that you really know you haven't already gotten yourself right. too deep into something, that you wish you had done this sort of ordinary, mm -hmm. let's look at all the curriculum yeah. and think about it. And, and either and one of you can talk about it. Sure. Yeah. yeah, so I think some of this came out of a meeting, and I, I tagged along with Mr. Sheehan with middle school faculty mm -hmm. um, who have been through a number of curriculum in the last 10 years. And uh, I think the other unique thing about this product as compared to the other ones, it's anyone could go home and Google it, and people probably are right now if they're watching on TV or in the back of the room. Um, you get an account for free, and you can see the whole curricula. So that's a real difference in terms of the review process, is that, uh, that by the time we'd met, and the middle school mm -hmm. staff, math staff, knew we were meeting with them, most of them had already been through the curricula. Um, and, and not that that's sufficient, but I think it's, it actually functionally changes the conversation um, and what, what I heard, and, and you can jump in from them, is, is they really wanted to have a curricula that was aligned to standards that gave them the tools they needed to, to work with the diversity of students they had. That any curricula they had, they're going to have to adjust and, and mm -hmm. work with. So they weren't, uh, it's a very veteran, you know, math yeah. faculty. They're, I think they're strong teachers. And what they've been, what was articulated at the meeting was the curricula they have and have had have not been all well, well aligned to to the standards, and that's an the additional layer of work has been a significant challenge. So uh, what I heard was um, they wanted a product that, that met with their philosophy of teaching, which was, again, that balanced view of computational fluency and, and math problem-solving and thinking. Uh, and so um, it, it felt very different than the conversation mm -hmm. with the math high school faculty mm -hmm. along those lines. Um, but we're still going to do the due, due diligence, and I'm sorry if I'm taking yeah, more yeah, time, that's fine. Of, of having them more formally go through, the grade 6 three teachers go through this, sharing it with the community, seeing if the community um, is on board. But th I think the other thing to note was they, you know, cost wasn't the only factor, but they were highly aware of how much, I mean, just to be very blunt about what we heard, how much has been spent on textbooks that have been ill-aligned to the curriculum and have not been functional tools. We're a one-to-one -one middle school at this point where every student has a Chromebook every day. Uh, and even if the first couple of years we buy some student workbooks and, and things like that, um, there was a lot of positive energy towards moving forward in a way that mm -hmm. supported their professional uh, development. And, and what I heard was if we have a, a tool that's aligned to standards, what really we want is more time with that tool, with each other, to further develop our skills instructionally um, and that seemed to be the focus that I heard that I yeah. was looking for. Yeah, that's exactly how I would um, describe that meeting. I mean, one of the teachers sort of pointed to the shelves and said, it, we, have, we have these books that were from 10 years ago, and, and I still draw on resources from those and those over there, and, and, and essentially that was it. Like, give us something that's aligned to the standards, that's a useful tool, that's helpful to students, um, and let us use all of our skills to, to make it work. I think the only other thing, sorry uh, to jump in, is the ad was the particular focus that I heard in the meeting on the achieve, the opportunity gaps, um, that the, mm -hmm. the, the items in the report they had a lot of thoughts on, and without their permission, I don't feel super wonderful trying to um, characterize them, but I think what they were looking for is something that was aligned to standards with the level of uh, the ability to differentiate it for English language learners, for students with special needs. And so that's the lens by which... Um, they want to view uh, the curricula mm -hmm. by the um, and the big interest even in, in having like Katie Richardson, who's our ELL coordinator, could she participate in some of this review and have the right people looking at the tools? Um, mm -hmm. But they were really focused on uh, if we have a, a, a tool that's aligned to standards and really can focus on the instructional aspects of teaching mathematics. Um, they felt really strongly mm -hmm. around that. So I, that was a surprise to me going in, and, and Mr. Sheen, we've spoken about it yeah. as well. Um, but there was strong consensus in the room to explore this one in great depth and, mm -hmm. um, and see where they Well, I, I appreciate the, I'm glad you guys digressed and you kept answering. Yeah. So I think it helps understand the slide and what you're doing much better. Mm -hmm. um, 
please continue, and the committee can ask questions as they wish. So, and this would absolutely have the other components to review the public feedback. That this one will not have books that get to sit at the Jones Library, but would have a website that that families could go to. And um, and actually, I would encourage you in your free time um, to to take a look. It's it's one thing that it does have, and I'm seeing with other cu curricula as well is components specifically for parents um, and, and it's which is nice to see where they can uh, parents who want to can parents or guardians who want to can go and take a look and and there's a description here's what your child is learning in math this week here is why it's taught that way because uh, most parents of I guess anyone from first grade on up will say I didn't learn this that way when I was in school um, and that's a reality, and it's nice to see that publishers are responding to that um, because the teachers try to, but obviously that's not the bulk of what they're doing. They're working on teaching the kids, so it'll be it'll be very nice to have some tool that also provides guidance for families. Where is this explanation for parents? Um, it, in this particular curriculum, you'd find it on their website. Uh, open book. It open up resources. Yes. Yep. Um, in some of the others I've seen, it's the same sort of thing. There's a, a, a portal on, on the web that um, it's handled in different ways by different publishers, but that has descriptions and, and guides. Right. So, and then um, achievement gap, which doesn't, this is sort of separate from the other pieces, but also important to sort of keep bringing up. And, and I put a whole lot of text on this slide. Uh, and then included some other notes for myself. Um, so in terms of the curriculum materials, this is something that we're very focused on, is knowing that we have a extremely wide range of students. Um, and we want something that is going to be the best tool for teachers to be able to teach all of those students. So providing intervention for students who are struggling, providing challenge for students who are achieving at a faster rate, um, and it, it's, it's a big ask, um, and I mean, one of the things that in the current curriculum at the middle level, at the, the big ideas curriculum, that was one that has never been terribly responsive uh, from what I've gathered from teachers to particularly students who are struggling in math. Um, and and it, there are some who will say that when it was chosen, the goal was more at looking at challenging advanced learners. Um, and, and that may have, and some of that was sort of the, the politics of what was going on in our community at that time. Um, so it, it didn't necessarily answer those things. Um, support for English learners. Um, so Katie Richardson has been working for a while and working on some curriculum and PD work on the language of math because we know that this is a challenge for a lot of our English learners. Um, and we're hoping that some of that will happen in June. Um, and gathering information from other schools that have addressed these challenges. Um, and now some of that has come out of that, some of the research that the uh, math teacher did this weekend. And some of it, there are others of us that have been doing some searching. What have other places done to address some of these things? Um, the focus professional development. And so this is something, again, Looney Math Consulting is going to work with us on guiding us through the textbook selection process, and then separately, we're also bringing them on board to do some professional development. Um, and one piece of it will be working with struggling students, differentiating instruction, teaching styles that allow teachers to spend time with smaller groups of students and provide more direct attention, because those things are really going to be key. Um, and And some of that is the curriculum, and some of that is the the teaching methodology that's used. Um, practices around progress monitoring and adjustment of intervention groups. Um, this is something we'll have an intervention teacher at the middle school next year. And so this is something that right from the start, we're going to be able to look at how are we doing this? How are we addressing these needs? Uh, the elementary schools have had intervention in math and language arts for quite a number of years. And this past year, one of the things that, that they've looked at is, is the progress monitoring. And I think this provides a model to look at at other levels. Um, they actually, it, I know for sure at one of the elementary schools, I think all three, they modified how they looked at student progress and actually managed to, when you work in 
let me back up, when you work in intervention groups, you assess students, you pick up the students with the greatest needs, and it might be in-class support, it might be some pull-out support. It happens for a period of time, you reassess, you adjust your groups, sort of the cycle begins again. The elementary school looked at figuring out how to compress those a bit so they can actually get a whole additional cycle in of intervention. And, and it wasn't by cutting out anything that students were getting, it was by looking at the assessment and trying to sort of compress that and make a, a more efficient use of time so that they could have more days working with students. Um, and the principals and the intervention teachers are both feeling very good about this right now. Um, so that's gonna be something to look at. Um, let's see. Uh, at the middle school, teachers currently take a lot of time after school at lunchtime uh, before school to provide extra support. In fact, the day that the math working group met, uh, we had to send somebody to page a couple of them because they had forgotten and they were upstairs working with students in their classrooms after the school day. Um, that'll continue, um, but, look, but hopefully we'll have better ways to bring about the instruction during class. Um, so maybe that won't be as necessary for some students. Um, and sure. oh. um, yeah, so, so, so I, re I really appreciate this slide. This mm -hmm. is like an excellent, like detailed level addressing what is a priority finding of the math report. I just, Dr. Morris, I just sort of wondering now that we're sort of past our budget discussion. Um, you, know, you talked about adding the inter intervention teacher, which is great. Um, I'm just looking at, at this kind of work, this important work. There's a lot, especially in that right column of bullets, mm -hmm. of, of staff time and additional staff time to meet these sort of individualized. Uh, learning needs like do you feel like this is staffed appropriately do you now that we're like we're getting more into the meat and potatoes of what's going to be required do you feel like have you had any second thoughts about staffing levels in terms of being able to fully meet like a lot of these bullets oh I think um, I say this so I think last time we talked some about I prepared a document um, related to the strategic planning work and there's a lot of synthesis. Well, that wasn't talking about math um, instruction specifically. It was talking about a number of these things about the opportunity gaps and how to um, and having that be the priority. So um, I think the reframe I'd have is that some of this certainly we're trying to do in June because we don't want to wait till the next school year. But some of this is actually just being very intentional with early release days, like we're having tomorrow and other professional time that staff are already here. Um, to be very intentional of our focus, that this is this is a primary focus of it, that it's not, um, the change in the curriculum isn't simply the change in the curriculum, it's actually an opportunity to reevaluate and reassess who we're reaching, who we're perhaps not reaching at the same level, who's underserved, and how we do that. So uh, from a staffing perspective, I'm not, um, I'm not concerned because we do also have, in addition to the intervention teacher, I think the other key component of this that I would be concerned if we didn't have is a grade 6 through 12 math, you know, I don't want to use the word coach because that means lots of different things, but Mr. Sheen will remind me what it's called. Uh, curriculum specialist. Thank you. Um, <laughs> who can really lead a lot of this professional cool. development, organize it, facilitate it, and schedule an organ, and so that it's not all mm -hmm. on Mr. Sheen, but actually someone who is a licensed expert math teacher to be leading this work. Yeah. Mr. Dennis? Yeah, just to, to follow up on that, I mean, I, I was having very similar uh, questions while mm -hmm. Mr. Sheehan was presenting on this piece, especially uh, just in relation to uh, the level of support that would be needed, mm -hmm. right, potentially for some of these students. And I think that, you know, my concern, and I think that this was articulated at the last meeting, mm -hmm. um, is that the degree to which uh, some students are underperforming, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, in math is so high that it feels like uh, the extra supports are warranted, even if it means an increase in resources, you know, temporarily, mm -hmm. right? So when you mentioned intervention specialist, I also agree, I think it's great. Uh, however, you know, I, I question if an intervention specialist is one person for, mm -hmm. you know, however many students is enough, right? Especially if we right. want to make sure that kids are feeling supported and most importantly that their families are also and caregivers are also mm -hmm. feeling supported through this process right because i think it's one thing to hear that your child isn't doing well on on testing it's another to hear that they're kind of falling through the cracks and you mm -hmm. know in their day-to-day -day math instruction 
and uh, I would imagine there's going to be a lot of families that are very concerned about that, you know, but I think beyond just their concern, it's also what can we do as a district, what, what are we, what's our responsibility here mm -hmm. to make sure that these kids are actually being well supported through that struggle so that they come out on the other side with the skills that they need in order to do well in life, right? And so. I do think, I, I want to keep pushing on this because mm -hmm. I do think it's really important that we actually are, uh, you know, supporting this and staffing this properly. I also have a concern about, um, you know, I, I hear when, when we put this in this way where, you know, uh, material is designed to support all students, right? I think on its face it's a good thing. Um, but, you know, when you, when you really d kind of dive into it, mm -hmm. um, the all students aren't the problem, right? The, the, you know, the, the, the right. concern here is actually with a subset of students mm -hmm. who need additional support. And so I want to be very mindful of that and thoughtful mm -hmm. of that, I think, as a district and as a committee, that we are adequately addressing the fact that we have these major gaps uh -huh. and that they are primarily among a certain subset of students and that we want to make sure that we're giving those students the support they need, it, and it, even if it means going above and beyond a certain level mm -hmm. to make sure that those, those kids have what they need in order to do well. Um, so I don't think we're talking about supporting all students. I mean, I think, mm -hmm. you know, we are at a certain level, but we're not on another level, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I, I do think that we have to be mindful of that as we're, as we're communicating around it. Um, and then I, I would just say that, you know, the, the, it's great to hear about the small group work and the station teaching and all the individualized strategies. Um, I do want to think a lot about how we are supporting the elementary school uh, staff as they are transitioning mm -hmm. and helping kids transition into the high school, right? Because it seems like that's, you know, you and I talked about that before. There's mm -hmm. big gaps there between those those two phases. Mm -hmm. um, so as kids are transitioning into middle school and into high school, how are we helping staff get through those transitions so they can actually hand that baton off? Uh, so to me, that doesn't just say, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, having perhaps you know, small uh, peer mentoring among teachers, right, so that they can support each other. Yeah. Maybe you're already talking about that, but I'm not seeing it reflected here. So I just want to articulate that, just, you know, in case we can have that conversation. So I want to, before you jump in, uh, two things. One, um, we're running out of time for this item, and I just want to put a fine point on that. Uh, two, there was a lot just thrown at you. And I don't actually think that either you or Dr. Morris need to answer all of it right now, mm -hmm. especially because some of it was actually more a matter of, I would like to think you, I'd like to encourage you to think about this, or I'd like to see it better reflected, or even something you rarely hear, um, which is, if you need more money to do this, we should talk about how to get it to you, mm -hmm. which is, if you, if you look at it from that perspective, and granted it's about helping the students achieve so the teachers teach effectively. But still at the same time, um, uh, although, although Mr. Magana might lose his mind over this, it's sort of a nice problem to have that people are saying we want to try to find a way to appropriately resource this and support its outcomes. So if you have additional thoughts, please do, but do not talk for 20 minutes or I'm going to hammer you. You can say. Uh, yeah, I, I just had one more that it isn't on a bullet but goes to a lot of what was sure. what was talked about and it was um, earlier today, I actually had a conversation with Dr. Guevara, and, and it was about sort of the, the larger issues, um, because the uh, opportunity gap, the achievement gap, is not just math, um, and, and it's not going to be solved by just math. Um, we could be teaching on a one to five ratio, and it is not going to solve those problems. And, and so that's something that sort of outside of the direct curriculum piece that I've, I've also sort of begun that discussion of how to explore and, and, and some of it is exactly that, those transitions and that support through those sorts of things. Um, the helping families that, particularly families who are more marginalized um, and don't deal with school in the same way that, that other families do, helping them understand what what's going to help students at home, what, is, what does my child need to know when they enter seventh grade um, before they get to the point that they're not passing the MCAS. Um, and, and, and other ideas are that, I mean, one that, that we talked about are some ways to get peer mentors for students mm -hmm. where there are older, in particular, older students of color who are strong in math, who are college students or high school students who could somehow support younger students and, and guide them through this. Um, so there's a lot of ideas out there and, and things that, that I think we would like to, to work on bringing about. 
Um, and so I thank you for those comments because it's, it is important. And I thank you for the comments on the, the language in the slide. It, it's sort of a challenge when you write a PowerPoint slide that's gonna end up on ACTV, like how do you, how do you spell this out? Um, so that somebody doesn't send an email and say, what do you mean you're only doing it for one group of stu <laughs> students? Um, so thank you very much for that. Yeah, Dr. Morris and Ms. Yeah, I'll be very brief. Um, just so I think in terms of additional resources and intervention staff, I do think one of the explicit strategies is to improve what we would call tier one instruction, so the core instruction. Mm -hmm. And if we don't do that, we'll never have enough intervention teachers to 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 do that. So I'm not suggesting that we, you know, that's not a conversation to be had, but I actually want to reemphasize that that having more intervention staff isn't the only approach and, and really if we're doing our work well with the tier one instruction that actually is the most important thing we can do and it's great to have more intervention staff I totally agree with that I mean we've talked about it in the budget uh, but I can't emphasize enough that improving the core instruction is the number one thing we can do to improve outcomes for kids it was a primary goal of trying to look at the math with so. I, I just want to uh, sort of put a, a little finesse on on some of the comments that were made about this particular slide so I understood this to mean that we're, you know, the, all the work that's being focused on closing that achievement gap and that opportunity gap. And, and I endorse and support all of the conversation that we've had about making sure that you all have the mm -hmm. appropriate resources to do that. I, I, but I want to go back to something that you said also that, you know, when we chose one curriculum, I don't know, mm -hmm. 10 years ago, our focus was on providing appropriate challenge for, for students mm -hmm. that might be achieving at or above, above mm -hmm. level. And I don't want us to be swinging all the way the other way right. as well. So yes and, <laughs> right? Like we need to not take our yeah. eye off of that. Um, we need to, so I do actually think that it is all students, though in this particular slide, in this mm -hmm. particular conversation, we are talking particularly about the students that do need more of that intervention and making sure that we have those resources. Right. So. You know, one of the things, we, we need to move on, but one of the things that I was reminded um, at our last meeting actually, and I talked to the superintendent about, is that, um, our conversations for us as a committee feel cumulative, but the reality is any individual person who's sitting out there in the public um, and is just trying to dial it and say, I hear something important is happening with math. I mm -hmm. want to understand, obviously, particularly for a lot of parents and stuff, but also we have like retired teachers who probably care deeply about what's going on, lots of folks in our community, uh, communities. And, um, and so in, in the case of last meeting, the issue that came up was the question that we, Previously, we had a meeting in which we said, this is a yes and conversation, in which, for example, at the high school level, no one's talking about abandoning a commitment to problem solving mm -hmm. and um, uh, helping students acquire significant levels of, of mathematical literacy about the concepts of math, but that the question was, how do you open that up in ways that have different, different modalities, different methods, and are able to reach all students who may come with different learning styles? Mm -hmm. Um, or like we do with the reading recovery, math recovery at the elementary level, <coughs> might have different places that they are and places mm -hmm. that are stuck that they need to be helped. The reason I bring this up is just because it, I, it, I, I mean, I don't want a half an hour discussion to become an hour and a half conversation because we're always repeating <coughs> things all the time. But I actually think some of the key themes, it's worth highlighting again because I think we're, mm -hmm. it, we can go down one particular avenue and then someone pulling in might say, Oh, so we're doing that now, and what they've mm -hmm. missed is the context that we were setting out because this is such an incredibly critical and deeply felt topic. But mm -hmm. thank you, you're doing a lot of work. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so what I'd like, thank you very much. So what I'd like to do um, with the committee's uh, indulgence, is I'd actually like to reorder our agenda. Um, I'd like to move advocacy to the end. I guess before accepting gifts. Do we have any gifts? Then it's moot. We can move it there, with there anyway. And then I'd like to move uh, the superintendent evaluation up to be the next item we're discussing now. I still suspect that some of these items we're going to be able to go through very quickly, but um, I, I just I think this is a better order of, of discussion to try to make sure that we get what we need to get done in a reasonable fashion. I see a cent. Great. Uh, who is... Uh, are you are you leading our conversation with superintendent evaluation? Okay. Awesome. Unless Please do. You want to so, um, and I apologize. I'm having some trouble today because my left ear is blocked. So if I'm a little flustered, yes. 
the reason. Um, so um, we met as the superintendent, superintendent evaluation subcommittee um, about, a, I think it was a week ago. I can't remember yeah, the exact date, but um, four of us met, um, including Andra, who's not going to be continuing on as a member of that um, committee. But um, she was one of the members with kind of the extensive knowledge of the process. I'm going to apologize in advance because this is my first time kind of going through this process, so I'm learning um, as well. But what I wanted to get um, feedback from the committee on today was support for the timeline and also um, it sounds like there's some questions about the process that came up in the conversation. I don't know if it's appropriate to address those today, but since it's on the um, I think agenda, we can start I, I think we could at least, we, if people had a strong feeling in response to the comment, public comment, I'd, I think it would be useful to the subcommittee to hear it. Absolutely. So, um, so the timeline you've got in front of you, this is a document that um, Audra shared with us about it from a year ago. And I'm bringing it back today just to say that when we met as a group, we felt strongly that option three was the option we should be pursuing um, in the future. And this just lays out the timeline for when um, the superintendent, um, it starts with artifacts, but f you know, generally you should start with goal setting, then sharing the artifacts, doing the individual evaluations, and then having an evaluation vote. And so the, the shaded lines indicate changes in uh, the members and also the, the budget vote. So we're proposing option three, which in practice would mean that um, on April 30th, our next meeting, we would share with the committee the instrument that um, we'd be using for the evaluation. On May 14th, we'd talk about doing, um, having Dr. Morris share the artifacts. And then also, I think at the same time, voting on the instrument. On May 28th, around about then, we'd be um, conducting the individual evaluations. Then on June 11th, um, or potentially, um, yeah, I think June 11th, we were talking about doing the evaluation vote, and then potentially doing some goal setting at that time, or doing the goal setting separately on June 25th along, um, along those lines. We'd want to just keep in mind that there's also all the work going along with the strategic planning, and we I think it's really appropriate that we have... Um, strategic planning conversation be at least at the same time and um, as we're getting the information from the strategic planning because ideally the goals should be aligned with the strategic plan. Um, so we would just want to know if the committee has any, and, and Dr. Morris obviously, has any reactions to um, this proposed timeline, concerns, questions. Um. What was the date? Or the individual evaluations? So I think. That's what I wanted to go through. Yeah. Just, just remind us of the dates. You're going sure. To so today's sure the 9th. On the 30th of April, we would present the instrument for review. We'd mm -hmm. vote on that instrument on May 14th. At the same time, Dr. Morris would potentially um, be sharing the artifacts. Remember last year he produced um, a Word document with hyperlinks. So that, that, that's what we're referring to. At some point between the 14th and the 11th of June, we would do the individual evaluations. Okay. Um, I was given the advice that we should make it a fairly short window to encourage people to complete those evaluations and not kind of keep pushing it off, so a two-week window ideally, and then vote on the evaluations on June 11th, June 25th, or also on the 11th to do goal setting. Okay, Dr. Morris? I was just going to say, Ms. Spitzer, just... You may have said this, but I'm not sure you did, has been in touch with me. I'm yes, very comfortable I, with the timeline from my perspective. Okay. So I just wanted to, it's not uh, new to me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, are there, uh, let me just, I guess for the sake of argument, I guess I'll ask the question, um, how many members from different towns do you think we're likely to be carrying over at that point on this schedule for the actual vote? I'm here. Okay. Um, and you're here. Yep. Okay. You're probably not here. I'm not here. You could be, right? <laughs> um. I'm sorry. I'm just teasing. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Publicly in front of you. I am sorry. I, that's, I, forgive me. I'm really sorry about that. Uh, all right. So that means one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right. That's that's a pretty good number. 
Yeah, maybe we should remind the public that those who are the new members often um, don't participate in the evaluation. And if they were to choose to participate in the evaluation, they'd only be able to really re remark on the period of time that they were sitting on the school committee. Yeah, and I was, and, I, I was yeah. sort of going the other direction of saying, you know, the, the key issue, which, which parallels that, mm -hmm. obviously, is that those people who have been on the committee who leave are not allowed right. to exactly. do it. So, that, so I, I, was, I was just looking at the calendar and trying to remind myself, who does that leave us with? And the answer is almost everyone. Mm -hmm. So that's not that's actually not so bad. Are there other questions or comments from the group? Yeah, I mean, I think there's no perfect way to get around the problem that every year you're going to have people cycling off before you actually do the evaluation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and really, looking at this at this colored chart, the only way to avoid that is to have the evaluation vote in April, which would essentially be now. And and just I think I think uh, there's probably a informal consensus that this feels really early to be evaluating the end of the year. <laughs> um, the goals, the, the goals then would be really off cycle with the school year. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, I think I think the option is presented is, is probably the best available. It, it also, having it be later in the year gives a lot of the committee the probability of still being on. So mm -hmm. if the Amherst member is cycling on in January, you're at least there for five and a half months yeah. before the, the yeah. vote, and then there's then there's probably. Makes sense. So, are there any other additional questions or comments about this? Um, I agree with this timeline. I, I actually think it works really well. Uh, the only question I guess I have, and maybe it's because it's different, is the June goal setting timeline. Um, it feels so soon after the end of, the, or not even, but almost the end of the school year to be thinking about what is coming mm -hmm. next. Um, and I'm just wondering if the subcommittee had any conversations around that, you know, and, and sort of what your thinking was with that. Because it feels like we've yeah. done it for so long around the August, sort of September time frame, you know, kind of screeching into the, the we fall. We did talk about that, and I'll defer to so, um, Mr. Sullivan if he has a little bit more historical knowledge on it. And it looks like Dr. Morris had a comment as well. Yeah, yeah we, um, discussed this last year because previously it we've been letting it slide sometimes even like until October November when we finally set the goals and last year the committee decided to try and get them done by the end of June or even if we or our, whenever our last meeting was for the school year because that way it gave Dr. Morris a chance to work with his administration and let and teachers and let them know what he was working <coughs> on for the for the upcoming mm -hmm. school year because it really was it was slot we were letting it slide where his goals were being presented in November right mm -hmm. um, and actually I should add that one of the things dr. Morris and I were talking about a couple of days ago was trying to sync up engaging around the strategic plan um, re relatively soon, like in maybe in our next meeting, yeah. if I'm correct, so that we could start syncing up um, how that plan and how some of the things that are coming out of it could inform a dialogue between the superintendent and the committee around our goals for the next few years, but also literally just for next year. I'm bringing that up only because we've already been thinking about how do we organize our discussions so that we can be better um, able to incorporate and think about those goals, but you're going to say? Yeah, so just supporting what Mr. Sullivan was saying, I mean, I think one of the things that even if it doesn't get to, you know, and this is up for the committee, even if it doesn't get to a, a vote on goals, but having a clear sense of the priorities of the committee, it helps me because summer's really the opportunity I have to work with the admin team mm -hmm. at, at a quieter time where, frankly, we can get more done um, sometimes, and it sets the stage for the next year. It's not like, oh, and we get together in October and late August and decide the plan. So it's been, it's felt awkward and ill-aligned for me that to have goals, even if they're passed in September, at that point the stage has been set. Um, so, you know, whether it's a formal vote or if it's just feedback and we have some pretty detailed discussion, that'd really helpful for me. And, it, and eventually the goal is where the superintendent goals, administrative team goals, and then eventually teacher goals actually are pretty synced up. But because that timeline has its own contractual right. obligations. The sooner I at least get some broad overview of, of areas of focus would be very helpful for me, and I think it'll actually make the goals um, more tangible and real for the people in the classrooms as well. Okay. Yeah. Great. So I think you have your marching orders on that. Great. Um, I just wanted to just 
point out why I recirculated the goals, uh -huh. and, and that's just that um, in the subcommittee review, we noted that there wasn't anything aligned with standard three, so I we went back to Dr. Moore and asked if he could make sure that that was reflected here. So we've added um, standard three A dash one yeah. to three. So that was the only change, but just wanted to highlight that for anybody who was wondering. Cool. Um, so I guess the, since the question came up, um, how uh, how do you engage staff in or others in stakeholders and feedback or so what we've done the last two years anyway is that I've done um, a survey of the people I directly supervise or kind of on second <coughs> tier um, supervision so assistant principals were included in that even though I'm not their direct supervisor um, we work collaboratively um, in, in similar ways um, to me, that's very good proxies. Uh, my, I find them they're very good proxies. They're anonymous surveys, so I don't know who's filled them out. I don't know, you know, who has done them. Um, and to me, they've been pretty honest, right? I mean, just to be very candid, there's been. It's not like everyone rated three out of four or whatever the rating scale was. There were areas that showed um, things were going smoothly, and areas that showed that um, they were needed for growth. And as Red planned to do to continue, certainly I'm open to other conversations. But um, I find that. The feedback of people I interact with on, a, you know, close to a day-to-day -day purpose, at our day-to-day -day level, um, to be incredibly helpful. And, you know, I don't know. That, that's my thoughts on the matter. Okay. Okay. Well, we will um, we'll march forward. So going back to uh, now, we're going to get back sort of on the regular order, and the next item. Arms, roof, discussion, and potential vote. And, and uh, I'm going to acknowledge the fact that for our committee, we typically see something first, talk about it, and then don't vote on it that meeting. And I don't think this is particularly an issue that is compelling that it needs a vote tonight. It was on in this way simply because we contemplated the possibility of vote. And as a little background, um, I think everyone on the committee is, has been through conversations and a vote are in a statement of interest for the middle school roof from the MSBA, discussion of the roof itself. Um, some members of the committee would have been around when we got back an analysis of the middle school roof that when it was at first um, authorized or developed, included the question of um, what's, the, uh, su what's the suitability of the roof to receive solar panels uh, to have them being put on. Uh, the analysis that came back to, to cut it in a very simple way said the roof as originally constructed and is currently maintained um, cannot support um, the deployment of the mounting brackets for um, solar panels, um, but that they could in fact be installed during um, the construction of the new roof. Um, and to be candid, uh, the, this, though the school committee has expressed some interest in the possibility of solar panels being deployed, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna out my conversations with this with the staff. The sense was they never felt like they got a clear direction from the regional school committee whether this is something we really want to do or not. And um, my sense of this, just speaking for myself, although this thing echoes some conversation with the school committee, is that I think a lot of people wanted to do it, but we also want to know it's a good idea. Meaning we'd like to have a further understanding about what the actual cost would be involved. Um, what the process would be involved, and then even maybe what the operating model would be um, for actually deploying, and what, the, what would be the benefits, what would be the carbon benefits, what would be the cash flow benefits uh, of it. Yes? So just a, a quick question. I mean, I think yeah. aside from a breach in protocol, if you will, yeah. is there any reason not to vote something like this? I mean, if the committee agrees, uh, no, that's why. That's that why it says possible vote. Okay, I, no just want, I just wanted to no, cut to the chase to make sure that we're understanding. <laughs> no, properly. no, no, yeah. there's, okay. nothing, there's no reason not okay. to either. It's okay. just uh, I figured since I put it on here, I wanted to <laughs> I wanted to like introduce it by saying if you want to wait an I extra meeting for the heck yeah. of it, go ahead. <laughs> and, and so, so this is basically the point of this is, in other words, as drafted, and I've talked about uh, this with Dr. Boris as well as Mr. Magana, was to try to basically put the committee on record that. Yes, we're interested in the idea, but we'd also like back some kind of analysis that shows us what, you know, how would it actually be done, what the, what the costs and benefits of it would be, so that we could make an informed decision around the investment. 
Mr. Dillon? Uh, Dr. Morris, what's, what would be the cost and time, the, the, the time and dollar cost of such a feasibility study? So the cost would be roughly $20,000. Um, time would be having a consultant do that work and a little procurement probably from our business office. I don't, I'm looking at Mr. Mangano. I don't think it's the procurement time is exorbitant. Um, but I'll let him Can see I ask you a it. question that goes in that though? Yeah. I'm assuming this is triggered by the, by the project moving forward. You're not doing this absent working on the roof, right? Right. right. So it wouldn't be our staff working on the roof. And we, if there was no, if we weren't intending to replace it, we wouldn't be doing it. It's part and parcel of the same thing. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I think the only thing I'll add is we had a question of whether we would do this now or wait until we got into the MSBA process and do it as part of the MSBA process. And I think we're still looking at that, what the pros and cons are. Um, doing it now would give us sort of the, the sense of is the cost so astronomical that it's not something we should even be thinking about or or not. Um, so that's sort of the decision we're still with. But um, in terms of the timeline to just procure somebody to look at it, it's not that long of a timeline. And notice the cool thing about the motion is it doesn't constrain you mm -hmm. from either doing it now or waiting, depending on what you think is most practical. It's appreciated. Spitzer. I just wanted to ask whether or not this feasibility study would do um, a comparison to say doing something like, um, oh, you've got it right there, but uh, uh, options for leasing and or purchasing panels. But I was also thinking about like the arrays over parking lots at places like UMass and things like that. Would that be something that would potentially, well, I'm assuming would be included? I just wanted to confirm that it would. That's interesting. So there's, there's sort of a separate process that's going, looking at that. Oh, okay. um, there was a sort of a request for funds that was submitted to look at the high school parking lot and oh, what a uh, array would look like there. So there is a process sort of moving. We don't know about the funding yet. Oh, nice. um, but this one, I think, would focus on the roof because of the, the replacement piece. Um, there's no parking lot replacement imminent, which is sort of a logical time to look at the array over the parking lot. Yeah, and just just to be uh, really clear about it, to Edwin Marcano said, um, when we talk about funding, that's actually through the state appropriation process, um, not MSBA, but actually the state representative has engaged the school district about uh, requesting that from the state budget. So that's not actually a local, it's not something we're requesting from capital from the towns that that's, that project would be either funded by the state as from the our state representative's request or not. From the parking lot. The parking lot, yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. So Just a follow-up question for clarification. The $20,000 or so that you mentioned that would, would cost, would that be uh, potentially part of a feasibility study if, the, if we are approved by the state? Because my understanding is that typically the, the town ends up paying for a significant portion of a feasibility study. Yeah, and I think that's the question that, that Mr. Magano was, was talking about earlier. So the question is whether we want to do that now um, if we have funds available or wait till that feasibility study process starts. But my question oh, I sorry, think is, is specifically about the money itself. So right. the $20,000, it doesn't matter if it's being spent now or being spent oh, later, yeah. we would we would still pay for it no matter what, right? Yeah, I don't think that would be a reimbursable right. cost. Yes. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. So would you say the downside is we spend 20000 we get the results back, and the answer is it's either not feasible or it's so astronomical that we would never pursue it and we're out 20000 That would be worst case scenario? Yes. I just want to make sure I understand that. Okay. I'll just say, you know, we are supportive of this motion. So in case there was any lack of clarity that okay. from the staff end, we think it's the right thing to do. Appreciate it. Mr. Gentleman? Would you entertain a motion? Yeah, sure. Uh, I move that the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee request that Superintendent Morris present a recommendation to the committee as to the feasibility of making the middle school roof solar panel ready with the intention of installing solar panels on the roof when the relevant credits and or incentives are next made available by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Further, the recommendation will include an analysis of the financial cost benefits of the solar panel project, including potential options for leasing and or purchasing panels. The recommendation should include, apart from the superintendent, the input of the finance director, facilities director, and a community member with relevant expertise in addition to students and faculty. There a second. Second. I move to a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by raising your hand. Carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, tenth grade MCAS exam letter to DESE possible vote. Um, if I'm guess well, first of all, everyone saw the letter, but I'm guessing also 
most people are aware that there was a pretty significant and meaningful controversy around um, a, a, particular letter, a particular question, an essay that was included within the MCAS exam, um, that I'm guessing, without speaking for the committee, because you'll get a chance to, that bothers you as much as it bothers me. Um, Dr. Morris, do you want to introduce sure. this? So the goal is that, you know, there was this question, as the chair mentioned, and a um, number of committee members um, have reached out to me, and I think I shared it. I can't speak for the committee, but there was a concern about um, what we were doing. You know, what I was doing as superintendent was, a was the school committee going to make a, um, to provide some advocacy um, on, on behalf of our community to express real concern about this and, um, and to let the powers that be, in this case the commissioner and the um, Massachusetts Board of Elementary and Secondary, uh, Secondary Education, know of our concerns. And so it's a possible vote um, because, you know, we want to present the letter and timeliness perhaps matters. But if we're not, you know, the committee's not ready to vote, certainly, you know, I'm not pushing for that. Uh, I do think a couple things I want to share. One is that I believe, to my knowledge, this is the first school committee that's formally taking this up as an issue. Certainly there's been a lot of public comment towards this. If you followed Boston Globe articles, the MTA has been involved, the author of the passage, Colson Whitehead, incredible author, so separate from this passage, highly encourage uh, you to read his, his works, have all had public comments, but I don't believe that I've heard of any school committee to date taking action, so I just think it's worth mentioning. Yeah, and actually one of the things, uh, when Dr. Morris and I were talking about this on Friday, um, and there's, no, there's nothing wrong with this, but in the past, we've had a tendency for the Dr. Morris to write a letter and send it off. And then if the school committee chooses, we vote some resolution and then we mail it off. And I just felt like this is one of those issues where there's a particular power in having the chief, chief educational leader and the school committee jointly um, expressing a statement to the commissioner. Uh, it just I think it has a power to it. Um, that hopefully would have some level of impact and attention, um, but anyways, that's so that was the that was the thinking behind it. And conveniently, um, if you want to call it that, this crazy brouhaha came up. Um, it was a really disturbing question came up um, when we could get it on our agenda tonight, which normally doesn't happen. We normally have to wait two more weeks to even talk about it. So, is there any? Is there any? If you hopefully you had a chance to read the letter, I don't know if you have any comments on it, otherwise it's certainly, I mean, I'm not sure to push you, yeah. but I'd entertain a motion to approve it as well. Um, yeah, so I'm very thankful that you put this together in as timely a manner as you did. I'm, I'm very thankful for the opportunity to act on this as quickly as we can. It's, it is truly remarkable thing that happened. I mean, just to quote one line from your letter, Des and this is quoting a high school teacher who wrote, yeah. Desi has required our students to think and write in the voice of a racist in order to graduate high school. <laughs> and so aside from how unconscionable that is, you know, the, the obvious question that you articulate later is, is how could Desi, you know, overseeing and running education from, from across the state be so disconnected and so lacking the point of view of educators? And, you know, this thematically relates to several issues in advocacy. And it's, it's this whole ideology of, of assessment and control and input and what, what the state who, and people, administrators who aren't educators are telling educators to do. Um, and so I, th I, think it's a, I think it's a really articulate letter, and I'm, I'm very happy to support that tonight. Thank you. Will you take a motion? I'd love to. Uh, I move to accept the letter as written by... Uh, Chair Nakajima and Dr. Morris uh, on behalf of the Regional School Committee to yes. Commissioner Riley and, and Desi. Is there a second? Second. second. So moved and seconded. Any further okay. discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify aye. Carries unanimously. Do you have a, like a copy that can be signed or something? I think this is well brought one. Cool. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Well. Yeah. Great. I mean, people can do it at the end of the meeting, yeah, so yeah. we don't want to yeah. muss it up at the moment. But. Yeah, I'll muss it up. You almost have. I'll okay. start that. That's great. Usually I'm watching you all. Um, like great. It's good to get that out of there. Uh, so then now we're going to move to design selection procedures. So we'll be moved advocacy down next after this. Although thematically, so you always correct it. <laughs> seems topically linked. Uh, so this agenda item, looking for a vote.
So just getting that out in the beginning. Um, it's the second reading. Uh, the policy subcommittee reviewed it last week um, as a quick refresher. These are selection procedures for architects and other designers when a project, um, when a construction cost of a project exceeds $300,000 and the architect fee exceeds $30,000. So it has to trigger both of those thresholds for these to kick in, although we typically follow them anyway. Um, these are the pr uh, procedures that we have followed in the past, but we're just trying to formalize the adoption um, of these procedures. Um, and these are the model procedures from the state. Um, so it covers everything that's in the law, essentially. Is there any further, is there further questions or discussions about this item? I know people are busy signing things right now, so I don't mean to take your time. But design selection procedures. Any further discussion? Entertain a motion if one is forthcoming. I move to approve the designer selection procedures. Is there a second? A second. It's been moved and seconded. Moved by Kastensen and seconded by Spitzer. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by raising your hand. We're voting. If you want to, you don't have to. <laughs> Carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, this is what I meant. We're in the middle of something, you know. It's like it sort of goes around, right shiny object, and also very significant. I think it's. I'm not to go back to it, but I'm very pleased that we're able to make this statement. Uh, speaking of which, by the way, we might actually, we might still actually. I don't want to jinx us. We might still actually get out of here on, on time. We, we have now started to move. We started to accelerate back onto schedule now, uh, unbelievably. Um, so uh, there's a lot cooking on advocacy. Um, you know, what I'd like to ask about. I'd like to ask about the Transparency and Charter School Act that I saw Mayor Narkowitz was uh, testifying on, on today. You know about this? I have known nothing of it. Really? Transparency and Charter Schools? You know something about this, don't you, Dr. This, is this MMA's S14? Yes. Or Hodge 14? It is. Four, I'm sorry, 418. Sorry. Do you want to talk about it? I certainly could. We're on, we're on, sorry, we're, I missed the introduction. We're on advocacy, by the way. Yeah. So this, and I mean, well, I, forgive me. What I actually did is I just jumped in with a topic on advocacy um, <laughs> without the usual preamble. And it's because my understanding is there's a very interesting bill that is um, before the legislature. Um, that I think does a couple things. I think one, it actually literally creates more legal and regulatory transparency, uh, enforceable transparency on charter schools. And I think it also changes the funding, right? It, yeah. Pretty substantially. Yeah, yeah. so it, it tries to mirror um, the foundation budget with an increment if, for districts that go over the foundation budget amount um, so that the cost of, the cost the districts bear of students attending charter school is more aligned actually with what the state says we district should be spending on students. It's trying to create a kind of synergy between the foundation budget and charter school funding. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Is it Ronias? Just a quick comment on that. I mean, I think that the challenge with, you know, just like we've seen with the foundation budget is um, we can push to get the state to agree to pay, to, to fund at a certain level, but actually getting them to do that is a whole other level. Um, this feels a lot like that, and I think it's, it's important for school committees and for districts to come out in, in support of this, you know, particular legislation. Um, but it's questionable about how far it'll go. I don't know if that's your impression or not, but, you know. Okay, Dr. Morris and Mr. Dunn. Yeah, so I, I think at a, can I make a broader statement? It's related to Mr. Dunn's point yeah. that um, uh, this topic came up at the Amherst Town Council, and I think what's relevant is that uh, they explicitly, two members explicitly stated that if there are school committee members um, who are involved in advocacy around state funding for schools, that they would actually like to partner. Uh, on this topic, and this bill, particularly the one that Mr. Chair brought up, uh, was one of the ones, and it's an interesting one because usually they come from not the MMA side, more from you know superintendents, MTA, MASC, MASS. Um, so, so that was what was novel about this yeah. one. It was actually where it originated from, um, and that piqued the interest of Amherst Town Council. And I know the other town select board of selectmen or select boards 
might be interested as well, but there was there was an explicit statement that school committee members who wanted to be involved in advocacy, they had partners and wanted to connect, and anyone who, like, we could do that offline. Yeah, so forgive me for throwing this out, by the way. I, I would, um, A, we can't do anything tonight. Right. So the couple things we need to do is we need to get more information about the bill. We, we, I, I didn't actually get a chance to read Aaron Narcos' statement today, his testimony, but I saw it, mm -hmm. and then I was like, cool, I want to read this. Um, then, of course, I ran off here and didn't bother reading it yet. Um, so um, I'd love to sh get that testimony and share it with all of you. Um, and then I think it would be great, certainly members of the committee want to do this, um, connect to the town council and see if there's something we could do and something we could even put on our next agenda here where we could maybe approve some letter or some action that would then go forward. I think these kind of bills don't move fast enough that it's like, it's an absolute emergency to get something out right now. And if there was a hearing today, then guess what? We already missed the hearing. <laughs> so it's like, so we. So the point is, we have. We, I think we have a couple of weeks to get a letter together if we want to. I'm sorry to jump in on this stuff, but I'm just excited. Yeah, about yeah, it. yeah. Mr. Hellman. That's good. Um, so yeah, so this. So H H four eighteen. So this is. I would put this in the category of no brainer. Of course, it's doing the right thing. It has very little chance of passing. Yeah. <laughs> because what it does is it shifts hundreds of millions of dollars uh, out of. Uh, uh, to fund charter schools away from districts and to the state, yeah. right? And so it requires that. And yeah. so just because of that price tag, it's never going to go anywhere. Um, it's but it's but, the reason but to push it. However, Sorry. yes. <laughs> however, it's very important for the MMA in particular, which is, um, I mean, to be direct, is a more powerful lobbying organization than MASC or school committees typically are, um, because it sh it shifts the idea. And I, th I think Mr. Nakajima, you mentioned this last meeting. That we, we talk about charter funding in terms of the pocketbook for the taxpayer, because when this shifts, what's, what's happening is that the, um, with the drain on school budgets from charter schools, you get a drain on municipal bu budgets from the schools, which then taps the taxpayer. You know, so that's the dotted line. And so when you have a municipal organization advocating for essentially a school funding uh, formula, that, that should definitely pique our interest. So there's, there's no reason why we should not be in support of that and pursue that. That being said, I think there are some other more urgent um, legislative issues going on right now that we could we could also talk about in this topic. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, we should certainly. It's I I almost I, I almost um, forget sometimes to to you know start an advocacy conversation with we have to fix charter school funding <laughs> just because I I automatically assume that we can't. <laughs> so it's good to always be yeah, hammering at that wall. In, I'll pray, let, letting it. I. It's like prop two and a half or prop thirteen. You you there are these big tectonic structural things that are absolutely crushing towns. And yes, it's really hurting our school budgets. That's what we focus on, and for with good reason. It's a lot of the argument we had around four towns meeting, where the fiscal pressures are starting to really, um, you know, pull apart the towns in ways that are really unhealthy. Um, and, I, and I also think I agree with you. I think the political power is precisely when you get boards of uh, select boards and town councils across the state, town meetings. Across, I mean, I still think, I've said this before in other venues, but the reason why question two lost was not just because people love their schools and love their teachers. It's because every single town meeting, city council and select board in the entire state had a practical experience about how charter expansions were devastating their budgets. And they said, we want to do more of this? Um, no, think of something else. Right. There was a very, there was a very direct felt pressure Put this on. So I'm sorry to jump on this, but this is like this is one of the things that I'm like massively passionate about, and the fact that somebody actually moved a bill mm -hmm. that we can. I mean, it's one thing to you know, wave a flag and mm -hmm. say I'm upset about this. It is much more powerful to say, oh, that bill over there. Let's move that bill, and even if it dies, let's push it again this session right. and next session. Right. Anyway, but what? Now let us know the other things <laughs> right. we should. Either one of you. Other things right. we should be writing so, soon or doing soon. A few suggestions. The first two should be. We'll be pretty familiar. So the uh, we already passed resolutions for the uh, for the Promise Act, which is the omnibus um, uh, fixed to, uh, uh, overhaul of the foundation budget, which we've you've noted before. Won't, we, won't, we won't be one of the districts that primarily benefits from it. But not only is it the right thing to do, but when you have a sea change of funding for educational funding, it's like a, a sea that lifts lifts all boats. You know, let's we'll start to get more attention to the to the other items. Um, so on May sixteenth, that's the big. Get everybody to Boston Day. Um, there is also a, a rally uh, at Springfield on the same day at 4:30, and so, but the primary one's going to be in Boston. I, I talked to several people um, a, a few weeks ago at the uh, initial hearing, 
uh, just about, you know, well, what is the secret sauce about how, what influences people? You know, do we have to write to the governor? Do we have to get people out? And it's, it's really is, there is no secret sauce. It really is about getting everybody out there. And as much of a loud, you know, raucous pro-education crowd as possible. So May 16th, 5 p.m. in Boston, that, that is the, the simple date that anybody can contribute to. Um, the second thing, uh, so we always talk about regional transportation reimbursement mm -hmm. and advocating for getting that broken promise fully funded. Um, we've, we've done lobbying efforts in the past to our local legislators. I was about to kick off something like that when lo and behold the first legislative letter that I saw with all the signatures from the senators and reps already had Senator Joe Comerford, yeah. Representative Dome, and Representative Natalie Blay, every representative who represents our district. So right. that's a great position to be in. So um, uh, I was going to suggest to Mr. Donia that we just reach out to them and say thank you and is there anything else that we can do to support that that effort. Um, I think that, by the way, I would I would do that right away. It, it's already sort of been done informally, but yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, because I just mean that's yeah. saying thank you and knowing you're paying yeah, attention absolutely. and respect that they're doing is yeah. the most important thing. Absolutely. Um, the third item is, I think we've talked about this once or twice before, but in Governor Baker's House 70 um, bill, there is a proposal to change the way that uh, charter mitigation is is doled out and essentially this is the transition aid that if your charter tuition increases year over year right now the master general law says that in year one you you a districts get reimbursed for a hundred percent of that value um, and then 25 percent in the succeeding four or five years um, the proposal in the governor's budget which he took him and the uh, secretary Pizer uh, and also Commissioner Riley interesting uh, we're all nodding heads in support of as uh, so they were testifying to the Joint Committee uh, on Education. What it would do is essentially um, only fund that change in tuition if you're at a five-year peak in your charter cost. If you're not at a five-year peak of your charter cost, you get nothing. And they were pitching this as a way to meet the commitment because this is one of those line items that's subject to appropriation, so it's constantly underfunded. Um, but what that would do is actually from, from a statewide Point of view it would reduce the amount the amount obligated to be funded from about 71 million to about 36 million and a lot of districts would be really devastated uh, our we would be our obligation would go down from 147 we would have 147,000 so the first year would be 147,000 and this would go down to zero um, there's the, the reason why I, I thought we could focus on this is because unlike some other things where we really struggle to get uh, political traction because we're out in western central mass we don't have as much concentrated political power this hits the bigger cities with a lot of representation. So Boston would lose over $11 million. Places like Worcester and Lowell would lose over a million dollars. So we could potentially reach out to other school committees, other select boards, and say, here's this thing that during this very busy time of education funding, you need to pay attention to and make sure that this doesn't happen. The motivation so. is? <laughs> so I, so I, I won't go on too, you know, too much further, but essentially there, there, there's an ideology, in, in my opinion, uh, and the opinion of many, that um, there are those who do not want to see education fully funded, and those who do not want taxes to be raised, and those who would like to see a reduction in the funding of public schools, uh, okay. so that things like charter schools and privatization of schools and social services uh, take a bigger hit off of public services, and that is their ideological game. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to present evidence for that ideology, but <laughs> you can read into the into your own lines about, about why that is. But anyway, this it's is also, kind of... It's also, being a practical matter, it's a way of eliminating an embarrassment. Every year somebody says to you, you underfund this account. So you change the formula and eligibility for the yeah. account, <laughs> and all of a sudden yeah. you <laughs> say, no, actually we're yeah, full it's... of funding. <laughs> Every, no, but I'm, I'm yeah. not to be more like administratively and bureaucratically right. cynical, oh, but it's yeah. like, but there's many other things that are done, including actually the entire baseline formula for funding charters, which are deeply ideological. <laughs> this one, I think, is actually more bureaucratically cynical than that. It's like, I want to make this problem go away. How do I tell everyone it's fully funded without without raising taxes or spending more money? Right. You know, right. I, just, I just simply change the formula. So, so all, the, all, the, all, the, all the language in support of this is we want to be a better partner to schools. We want to meet our commitment and what they're doing and is cutting change, it in half. if you change the formula to the commitment, they suddenly are magically Exactly, meeting. exactly. So, anyways, we should probably... So just a, yes. a, sorry to interject. No, I'm please. just uh, wondering, you know, what would be helpful for the chair and for the committee from 
you know, presumably me and Mr. Demling uh, yeah. to, to bring, you know, for the next advocacy report, right? Because this has well, felt a little disjointed and, we, you know, we haven't prepared Well, we don't really have a plan. That's I, what, I mean, well, that's, that's what, is, yeah. should there be a plan, right? Like, should there be something that we're presenting to the committee to approve, you know, is there some something that could be potentially helpful beyond just the work that yeah, we're I mean, I think doing? Yeah, I think there's a couple things. I mean, one, I think we actually should have more of a plan. I mean, we know what the roadmap is for the various budgets that are going to be released by... House and Senate Ways and Means, and then the process of going through the voting their budgets and then reconciling their budgets. And we know the timeline, right? So it, it's every, the same within, within a few days or a week of each other, they're the same every single year. So we know what the roadmap looks like in terms of this stuff. Um, what, we, what we really need to know is um, I think there are a couple things. One, I actually think it would be useful if we could draft a letter, um, and, and forgive me for saying this. It could be with the superintendent or without him, depending on how, because I don't think there's much partisan in this. I think most of it's actually, I don't mean partisan meaning yeah. an, an elected rhetor, an elective official's rhetorical statement as opposed to sort of the facts. And um, depending on how we want to swing it, I think we should actually develop some kind of a letter that includes sort of as an omnibus all the different elements that we think are actually really important for our district. Um, it should include language of support for our legislators where, the, where they are already working or supporting or doing things. So we should be gracious about it. And we should um, be prepared to submit it to, to, to our, our representatives, but also any relevant committee as well. Um, and then I think beneath that, um, if there are particular items of advocacy where we could be pull something out around, for example, what you're describing, Mr. Demley, um, we should probably find out where we're getting traction from you know, what's, what is MASC working on on this? What, you know, how does it sync up with what MTA is doing, rural schools or whatever, so that we can, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that what we're doing is strategic. If we think we can do something where we can lead or champion, that's great, but I wonder if we have the, uh, the time and the energy to do that. I mean, if we do, we do, that's awesome. But if there's a bandwagon to jump on and to amplify, we should probably try to do that. Yeah. And then, if possible, I would suggest next meeting we get some sort of an outline or of where we go. Okay, that's great. That's helpful direction. All right, cool. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, one idea is that, I, forgive me, if the letter in the bulletin is exclusively for the local Amherst schools, but it seems like if there are really items on the agenda for advocacy where we'd like the public to get more engaged, I think potentially a letter in the bulletin might be a good way to make the public aware and encourage participation. Sure. And, just also advertise that we're paying attention to this and it's on top of our agendas. Um, can I yeah. speak to that? So the, the letter in the bulletin, because it was the Amherst bulletin, was specific to the Amherst School Committee. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if the chair and if the committee wanted to maybe work with the other, you know, uh, representatives from the other towns and try to see if some way of, of uh, coordinating something across the different, you know, papers, maybe the Gazette carries something and then, you know, probably do something like that too but we can certainly help draft some language that could be used in all those different ways I think that would be great I think I think that'd be great you can certainly get more attention yeah mm -hmm. I think it's and potentially action yeah that's great and actually we you know we should do if we can we should do it before May 16th yeah that's <laughs> we feed into getting people who should, right, why, hi, yeah, right yeah right exactly yeah. Right. I mean right. why the heck not sure uh, so that sounds great great thank you okay uh, okay at the risk of moving things along uh, we're going to move things along and there are no gifts, as we said earlier. Uh, super school committee planning. So other than math update, um, what do we have next time? So I have superintendent evaluation tool. There's two policies, one for a possible vote, one for a first read that I received from Ms. McDonald yep. from the policy subcommittee. An update in strategic planning. Seems like advocacy probably should be put oh, yeah, on there. Um, third quarter budget yep. is another one. And just as a preview for May, I've got um, superintendent evaluation, a bunch of stuff, artifacts and, and, and others. A seal of biliteracy. So the seal of biliteracy is, not to go into detail, but just so people know what that is, the state with the Look Act created a pathway for students to graduate with an additional, what it sounds like, seal of biliteracy for bi uh, bilingual students. We've been, our staff have been doing a bunch of work on that. We need to actually bring it to the regional school committee. Um, um, to keep you in the loop and eventually for a vote. A vote probably wouldn't be in May, but just we want to update mm -hmm. that. Uh, vaping prevention, I'd like to put that on after that meeting, the uh, PD that I'm attending in May, that you were all invited to, not literally all, 
Squamishes, but you were all um, cordially invited to attend um, Homelessness and Late Start were two other topics that I yeah. have from previous meetings that people had shared. Uh, and the other one was homework um, load at the secondary level that we'd like to get to in the two May meetings. And it could be later, maybe in June, but we wanted to round out at some point a, a presentation on food services and a preview of anything next year. Thank you. I did not have that, but you're 100% right. Okay. Cool. Uh, as always, if there are other topics people are interested in, they can email me and the superintendent. Um, there's a Yes. I just, um, with the vaping, I feel like it could potentially intersect with the conversation that we still haven't had, I don't think, on marijuana. Um, just putting it out there. That okay. I think we, in a while ago, talked about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, substance abuse more generally, perhaps. Okay. Yeah. You want to broaden it out? I'm happy to. Great. But without losing vaping. I mean, I know there's been yeah, a lot of discussion no, about it. But there might be an intersection. Uh, I think it would be. Um, great. Wonderful. Is there a move to adjourn? So moved. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> it's like, no one wants to. <laughs> um, all, all of those in favor? It's, like, we, it's unanimous. We are adjourned. Thank you very Three much. minutes early. Thank you.